Happy early Thanksgiving, my friends. I hope you have some safe travels. And hopefully the airlines are not overcharging you for your carry-on luggage. Go spend time with your family. Gain some weight. And have a couple of drinks and think of me. Welcome to another episode of A Taboo Life. Where everyone has a story to tell. I'm your host, Drew Franks. Or Frank for short. I want to thank you guys again for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and also check out the website ataboolife.com where you can read some interesting articles, short stories, poems, and prose, and other great content too. So check out the website ataboolife.com. Today's guest is Mr. Jordan Borselman. He is a blacksmith here in Florida. I had a Great long conversation with this guy. Really fascinating. Uh, I learned a lot about being a blacksmith, the process, how to choose your uh, your metal, and uh, the mythology behind blacksmithing. Um, Jordan is actually a uh, pagan, and it was actually pretty interesting learning about his religion because I always wanted to learn about other people's what other people worship, but. Fantastic guy. We had a freaking great long conversation. Um, check out his um, website, Crooked Path Forge. Go order some of his knives, his axes, his hatchets. He also does custom work too. So if you have a certain project, um, he's up for the challenge. Just go ahead and email him. Uh, again, his business is called Crooked Path Forge, just outside of Gainesville, Florida. So here's the episode, and I hope you guys enjoy it just as much as I did. And we're live. All right, guys, I want you to give a very special welcome to Mr. Uh, my name is Jordan Borstelman, and uh, I'm a blacksmith here at Crooked Path Forge. Crooked Path Forge. It is uh, 15 miles outside of Gainesville, right? Yeah. Yeah, this was a fun little drive out here. I uh, passed by a lot of cow farms, and I uh, <laughs> actually thought about, like, maybe I should go uh, mushroom hunting after this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you definitely can. It I was is thinking a long like last time. Like, there's some mushrooms out there. <laughs> That's funny, man. Yeah, there's uh, you know, my 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 wife is big into uh, gardening and everything, and mm. so we we get actual edible mushrooms from, oh. from the woods around here quite often. She'll go picking, and uh, she knows the ones that are not poisonous and are See, edible. So yeah, I wanted to do that, but I was I was afraid of that. Like, how can I tell which one's not poisonous? And yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking like so. I buy like a book and or get, is there an app? <laughs> there probably so is probably app, app now, right? <laughs> Which one's the one that I get to see shit? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that goes in the cow patties, man. <laughs> the That's cow, how you find that. Still cyber. You'll be good. Yeah, um, Jordan had we're outside um, recording in his uh, forge forge slash uh, workshop, and he has a whole bunch of pet chickens that are coming around us right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, look at that. <laughs> they come and say hello. Oh, let me take a picture roll. All right. So, blacksmithing. Yeah. Is, we were talking earlier, is one of those uh, professions that, one, is really old. It's an old profession. It is. And two, that's kind of like the whole, uh, the, probably the most representation of masculinity there is. <laughs> like right next to soldier being a soldier or sure. a firefighter or a cop, then there's blacksmith. So, like one thing you think of a man is like <laughs> think a man yeah, yeah, a hammer yeah. and anvil <laughs> making shit. <laughs> well, you know, it's 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 something that as a as a youngster, you know, I I I read a lot of uh like fantasy books when I was a kid and I read a lot of uh you know, like Conan and, and <laughs> things like that and and there was this like this romance, this like in, in my imagination, it was such a cool and fantastic profession, and it's part of what led me to get into it. Just, just 
you know, I don't know, like, like those fantasies of my childhood actually being real <laughs> was, I was like, wow, you mean I can do that for real? Okay. okay <laughs> yeah, like, let's, let's do it. <laughs> let's do that, you know? Um, and it is like, it's, 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 and maybe we'll get into this later. I don't know, but it's, it is part of like what, what got me into feeling like and, and being, you know, a man, like thinking about that and, and being an adult really, uh, I didn't learn how to be an adult until I learned how to be a blacksmith. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, yeah, I mean, anybody could blacksmith. You know, you don't have to be a, like a big burly dude. Yeah. Uh, just to get that out in front <laughs> um, a lot. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a heavily, there's a lot of dudes and they're like big burly dudes. But I teach classes. I teach lots of classes for this. And, uh, dude, anybody can do it. I've had, I've had. You know, older people like in their seventies come out and swing a hammer effectively. <laughs> you know, I've had people I can put both hands around their waist, and and they've still. It's a lot. The more I learn about it, the more it's about control uh-huh. than it is about beef and muscle and strength. So, how did you get? What was the first um, first first items you made or first uh, products you made? Yeah. So, uh, what when was it? When you was a kid? No, you know, I I got I really got seriously started in my twenties, mm-hmm. uh, early twenties. I went to a school up in North Carolina called the Penland School of Crafts. Oh wow! And uh, they have blacksmithing there. They have glass blowing. They've got all kinds of stuff. And um, so I took like a two week introductory course there, and they had us make like a few simple items. I made a letter opener. <laughs> um, what else did we do? Bottle opener. They had us just do like some more artistic things. Uh, I made a sort of a, like a, a stylized ram's head, uh, mm-hmm. which I still have today. Actually, it's pretty <laughs> cool. Uh, so that was that was kind of where I got the start there. Um, but it was a while before I really started to build it up here at at my own house and have a real shop and think of myself as a professional smith. What was the process of becoming professional? Oh man, a lot of luck. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I still, I wake up in the morning still and I, and I, I look at my wife and I'm just like, I'm a fucking blacksmith. Like, can you believe it? Like, let's go start the forge. This is or... how I pay my bills. <laughs> this is, you know, it blows my mind still, but I just, I don't know. I, I used to be, I used to think I was going to be a rock and roll star and a musician. Mm-hmm. And we, we pushed it so hard when I was, when I was younger and me and my buddies in the band. And, and we pushed and pushed and it never happened. And it was like, it was kind of devastating a lot, you know, and, and I lost my way and wasn't sure what I was going to do. And I just kind of picked up these crappy, you know, minimum wage jobs. And, uh, there was just this one day when I I was like, if I'm going to do a minimum wage job, I need to have something else that gives, gives me fulfillment. Yeah. And I had taken the classes, did done the blacksmithing classes before. And I had a little, a few tools and I finally just set up set up this rickety little shed here in the yard. Um, I mean, you, you can see it right over the, there. That, the that was one? the original shop, which is just like I don't know. It's 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 just some tin roofing and like some rotten wood. But I started there, and I I just started playing around and. After a while, I started making some knives. A buddy of mine came over, and we 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 made a few knives together. And uh, I put I, you know, I showed somebody, and they went, "Hey, I'll buy that." And that just that was really how it started to get serious. Um, it, and I just thought, well, okay, if I'm going to sell these, I need to, I can't just dick around. I can't just be playing around. I got to get a little bit serious. Mm-hmm. And and that was sort of the start of, you know. If I'm putting out a product, I need to be able to stand behind it. If I'm going to stand behind it, I need to know my shit. You know, I need to know yeah, what's cr- going on, like, scientifically, molecularly. Stuff. Also, Ooh. yeah, the craft, <laughs> the, the hammer control and all this other stuff. And so the whole thing just kind of built from there. And I saved up en- enough money uh, selling knives to buy, you know, my first real anvil. And then saved up enough money selling knives to buy the next tool and the next tool. And I just kind of <laughs> built it. So, yeah. <laughs> and now you have a legit freaking workshop. <laughs> it's yeah, man. I'm like, I'm so like, you know, a welder. I've got a press. I've got, you know, I, I'm missing a power hammer, but otherwise, I've got really what, everything. What's I a power can, hammer? I could want. So it's a it's a mechanical hammer. Mm-hmm. Um, 
think of, imagine a piston you oh. know with a, a square makeshift anvil, un- anvil mm-hmm. underneath it and it just rhythmically pounds down on top of that uh you know on top of that anvil yeah. and, it's, and it's it's a way to forge steel mm-hmm. that's way bigger and beefier than you could do by hand alone okay uh and it's you know it's it's a, it's an automated hammer essentially <laughs> uh, so a lot of the big professionals big time professionals have those and I'll get one one day, but <laughs> I also like doing it by hand. Yeah, you know, there's something about makes, doing something by hand. Yeah. Like, yeah, this is something I made. Oh yeah, <laughs> and that's also that's also the uh, kind of how how I've informed the style of my blades and and how I work on stuff because uh, you can make a knife or or other things, but a knife in particular you can you can make by just cutting it out of a piece of steel. Mm-hmm. You know, a CNC machine, like a, a plasma cutting machine or something like that. You can grind on it, and you'd never have to touch a hammer and anvil to make a knife. Uh, but when I go out, and and people are like, "Oh, you're you are you make knives," and they'll make this motion with their hands, like they're hammering. They don't know the words, <laughs> but they know but you, you know, know that, that this is involved. Hammering is somehow involved, and so I want to be like, "Yes, that's what I do." You know, when you do that little hammering motion, it's like, "Yes, that's how I make them." And so I feel like that's more honest, in the sense of like that's what people's expectations are when I say I'm a blacksmith. And so I want to meet those expectations as well, you know, and, and do as much as I can with the hammer and anvil, you know, me by myself, or at least, you know, with the power of arms. <laughs> um, I remember reading on your webpage cause, um, my friend Joe, he's the one who suggested me do the interview with you. Cause he, like I was telling you earlier, him and my other friend, Jamie, they love actually original pr- uh, works of, works of the craftsmanship for okay. knives and axes. So they they love look at the YouTube videos and uh, <laughs> yeah yeah oh yeah and um, the websites. But he found you and he suggested me for you. And I remember reading that on a blog that you wrote. You started out doing bartending first before this. Yeah, and you're like screw it. <laughs> yeah yeah. So I mean. Part part of like part of the why I chose the name Crooked Path Forge mm-hmm. is because I I've I've been a lot of different things before I landed here, uh, you know, minimum wage jobs. I was a zookeeper for a while. Oh, wow. I, I was a bartender. <laughs> a yeah, yeah. What were you doing in the zoo? Uh, so it was a it was a small nonprofit uh, that just focused on fruit bats oh. called the Luby Bat Conservancy. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it was it was founded by Louis Bacardi of Bacardi Rum. Mm-hmm. If you look at their labels, they got the, the little bat. bat, right? And so, you know, when he passed away, he left money for this organization. And uh, anyway, I I started working there. A uh, neighbor of mine worked there, and he got me a job. And you know, I learned how to take care of the animals and feed them and 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 handle them and things like that. And uh, so I did that for a while. So I was you know I was a zookeeper for like five years, <laughs> uh, and a bartender and a musician and. Um, so it was a crooked path, you know, mm-hmm. to get to the blacksmithing. Um, and I still do, I do, I still do bartend three days a week. Yeah. Uh, that's just, it just helps even out the, the pay scale, you know? Yeah. Uh, cause like a bunch of commissions will come in and then I won't have a lot of commissions. And so it's always going to have like a go up and plan. down. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so I think I'll probably stick with that for quite some time. Like I think that'll be uh, just a nice little part-time gig. It'll break up the monotony of being in the forge too a little bit so yeah because then uh, yeah you need to get out and talk to pe- talk to some people too oh, dude yeah yeah <laughs> it's you like get, how do you, you get stuck out here instead of talking to the chickens <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly yeah it's good to have that balance i think so uh so yeah so that's bartending yeah, bart- it's fun yeah, and also um one thing that's i think it's growing too um original crafts craftsmanship like that is starting to come back because i remember you can kind of see with the economy too yeah. while these uh while these restaurants stores um ebay stores and um what's that etsy, etsy yeah. yeah etsy oh, yeah. I, I got some stuff from etsy too there's something like very personal and very unique about getting something that's made by a single person instead of like something made in china yeah, yeah, it's like factory no, production. This stuff. one took time. It is unique. Nobody else is going to have it, and, mm-hmm. there's, and there's a story behind it too. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. Like that's 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 also part of why I got into this. Is uh, you know, 
it's it's and it's it's not disposable either right you don't just buy it and then use it and you throw it out like then my knives my tools are meant to last beyond your lifetime you know these are things you can hand down to your children you know and their children uh that's that's the idea anyway you know and and it's hard it was hard for me when I first was out on my own and I was like, I wanted to buy some, I had a, I had a little bit of money saved up. I remember, and I wanted to buy a radio for my car. I, I just had, I had a regular radio, but I wanted something that played CDs. Mm. This was back when CDs were a CDs. thing, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I lived on a bumpy road and I was like, I want, I want a CD player that's like known for higher quality and bumpy roads. It doesn't skip on mm. the CD and all this stuff. And I went into, you know, like one of these big box stores that specialized in electronics. And I was like, Hey, I want a nice one. I don't need all the bells and whistles. I want something though that's like known for quality and will last. And the salesperson couldn't tell me. They could go, oh, well, this one's more expensive and it has Bluetooth and it has this and that. And I was like, I don't, I don't need that. Like, I just needed to play CDs, but I needed to play CDs forever. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, which one gonna, is that one? It's going to last a long time. And he couldn't, like, he, he just didn't have that information because, I don't, you know, that's not a priority for these companies they want it to fall apart they want it to yeah they want you know, to then you buy the next one right yeah. or at least repair it like yeah oh, we'll call well, at, at, in real world it, it costs like ten dollars repair for them 200 sure yeah so yeah so it like, like part of that spurred me too like i want to if i'm going to make something i'm going to make it i'm going to make it to last forever and it's going to be of a quality and craftsmanship that it's it's worth the money that you buy because you only have to buy it once yeah you know um. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's how I feel about that's that, how, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and then um, small business is coming back, which is good. It is. Oh, it is. So we, you still have to work some, some part time jobs, like you said. You still do the bartending, but mm-hmm. it's coming back, which is good because, like, I think. In fact, yeah, we need quality made stuff again, and actually cool looking quality stuff too. Absolutely, and I. I it's tough because when you're at the bottom, mm-hmm. you know, and you're you're making minimum wage and you're 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 working real hard for your living, uh, your only options are the cheapest options, you know. And so uh, it's 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 difficult to get to that point where you have enough money that you can actually save money because now you can buy the nice things that last longer and you're not going through. Forty dollars shoes in two weeks. You know, now <laughs> yeah. I can buy I can buy a pair of shoes, right? Like I can buy a pair of shoes that cost one hundred and fifty bucks, and they'll last me five years. Yeah. And it's like, it's it, there's there's that I don't know there's that kind of thing going on. And so I think about that too when I when I price out the stuff that I make. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not I'm not the cheap option. I tell people that all the time, but I also try not to make like charge so much that. I'm out of the range of, of working class people, yeah. you know, and I'm out of the range of where, oh, you spend like you spend a thousand dollars on an axe, say mm-hmm. you're never going to actually use that, that axe is never going to touch wood. Yeah, because it's a thousand dollars. Oh, man, I don't want to. Yeah, you I don't, don't want, want to use it. it up, yeah, I don't want to. Right. Like, I want you to mess my stuff up. You know, like I want <laughs> it's it supposed to, to be used. used. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll eventually get to the point where I'll make more artistic pieces mm-hmm. and they'll be, you know, maybe a thousand dollars and two thousand or whatever. Um, and they'll go up on a wall somewhere and there'll be a display piece, but the core of it, it, it still could be used. And that's part of my goal too, is that it's still, if it's not done right, if it's not something like if you have a sword on your wall that you can't take down and chop someone's head off with, then it's not a sword. <laughs> it's a decoration. Yeah. It's a piece of metal <laughs> in the shape of a sword. That's cool, but don't needs, lie to yourself. It needs to be used. Yeah. Yeah, it or or it should be able to be used, you know. Um, so that's also part of what informs how I make things and what I do is is making sure that it's real. It's got to be real. That's, yeah, you know, that's the, that's the whole point. Um, what kind? Because you mentioned knives and axes. What else yeah. do you make? Um, so I do a lot of commission work mm-hmm. that can just be. I mean, people just throw stuff. Hey, can you do this? So right now, um, I've got a set of woodworkers chisels Ooh. that I'm looking to make. You know, so that that's something that now this guy is gonna make stuff with those chisels, and and that stuff is gonna go out into the world. <laughs> Man, that's so and cool. And I like that idea. Yeah, right. It's kind of you're, you're, you're making something to make something else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's really that's what's fascinating about the blacksmith trade, right? Like, 
a carpenter can make a table, mm-hmm. but he can't make the chisels he uses to make the table. Like or the brackets. Yeah, right, right. Any of the any of the metal hardware, and so uh, that's that's what I do. Like, and that's why I like tools and making tools more than other stuff. Uh, the hammers that I use to forge my steel out with, I made the hammers. Really? Yeah, yeah. Um, and and so like a lot of the tools that I use to shape things. I have to make. Nobody else makes them. You can't go to Walmart. You can't go and get them made except by another blacksmith. So um, I like that idea, you know, the, of, of, of making stuff that then makes stuff. Uh, so, yeah, wood chisels I've, I'm, I'm working on now. Um, a lot of other woodworking tools that are hard to find. So, like, there's a thing called a bowl adds that, that I've done a little bit. So if you picture an axe, mm-hmm. the blade is in line with the handle. Okay. So an ADZE, A-D-Z-E, mm-hmm. is the uh, same thing, except for the blade is perpendicular to the handle. So it's like a T. It's it, yeah, it's making a T with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you, you use that for carving out chunks in wood. Oh, that's for uh, like... like if you're going to make a canoe. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if you do like a dugout canoe, <laughs> uh-huh. you would use a bowl ADZE. You make bowls mm-hmm. with a bowl ADZE, right? Um, so I, I, I've, twice now I've made some for w- different woodworkers. Uh, that's been fun. I'm trying to think what other wacky tools I've done. Um, this this guy wanted to trim his banana leaves in his backyard, uh-huh. and so he just designed this weird curved, like hooked blade on the end of a pole, so that he could reach up and and cut off the it's dead leaves like underneath a, banana trees, like a not a sif, a um sickle. Yeah, basically. yeah, yeah. But on a on a on a longer uh-huh. stick, essentially, yeah. And so I don't know if any if that's ever been a thing, or he made it up in his own mind, and then I made it. And well, I, I, that's fun too. Well, I have one that's um from Home Depot. I, I know what he's talking about. It is like a sickle, but on a longer stick. Yeah, yeah. My, the one I guess is like the aluminum one that you could this telescopic handle. Yep. But yeah, those those exist. You made one. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he, you know, he's in love with that. So it's I like I like a challenge with that too. You know. I'm, my wife is always amazed. She's like, I'll take a commission for something I've never made before. And she's like, you just, shouldn't you make some first? And I was like, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> well, what's, what's the process of like, let's, let's say, um, I'm trying to think of something like very unique. Um, I love, I love comic books. And, okay, yeah. and we were talking about, uh, before we started the episode, we were talking about how you're very into Norse mythology. We're going, we're going to that later. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, cool. You, about your heritage and background. But let's say, like, I want, like, a legit, um, Mjolnir. Yeah. Or what would yeah. be the process? It's a, have you designed, like, a, something like that before? So not, uh, not specifically as, like, a, a, a replica or anything mm-hmm. of, of Mjolnir itself, but, uh, I, you know, I've done forging hammers, which yes. are slightly different. But let's say like uh, I want Mjolnir and yeah, like, that's specific. Yeah. Like so, so yeah. what what would be the process of you gain doing that? So you know, I mean, I'd have to look at, at what kind of steel we're going to deal with is going to be the first thing. Um, and if we're if we're going to look at <laughs> like doing the one out of the comic book, since we're going to talk about <laughs> Thor's hammer for the comic book, that thing is like it's massive. Massive. Uh, and so you know let's do it legit like let's say this is going to be a real weapon that's going to be used by the the Mm -hmm. god of thunder so we're going to assume he's strong enough to pick it up yes it's going to be a big honking piece of steel and i want to use it so (laughs) you're a big fella too dude you you probably absolutely could use it so i'd have to source the metal um it's 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 something that big is probably not something i'm gonna be able to find in a scrap yard Mm -hmm. or whatever um so i'll have to source it but that's not very exciting to listen to. to no, let's, so, talk, let's talk about uh, the process because uh, I might need to ask some questions okay. while we're talking. Yeah, sure. All right. Um, so the kind of steel is going to be important. Um, I would I would probably go with forty one forty. It's a it's what's called a medium carbon steel. Mm-hmm. So the higher the carbon, sort of the harder you can get the metal okay. when you heat treat it. And um, uh, so we would want to heat treat it somewhat so that you can smash it into say. Uh, like you can smash the hood of a car with it mm-hmm. or, uh, you know, hammer into an, an armored shield and you're not going to put a lot of dents in the face. So we want to harden it some, but we don't need it as hard as say like a, a, a barber's razor or a, a, you know, a scythe or a sharp mm-hmm. blade. So a medium carbon steel is what we'd probably want to go with. Um, I know I can get 4140 in the size I would need, which would probably be 
I don't know, probably three inches mm-hmm. square and solid. Okay. Um, so I'd buy the steel. Uh, you know, I would I would cut a chunk off the larger piece about the size I needed. Uh, and then the first thing you got to do is put the hole in it for the handle. That's the most complicated. If you're off just a little bit when you start the hole, as the punch goes through the steel... If it's off a little at the top, it'll be really off by the time it gets to the bottom. What do you right? mean by off? Because I'm trying to picture it in my uh, head. Yeah, yeah. So I'll have a I'll have a punch uh, that I'm gonna hammer through the steel mm-hmm. in order to make the hole. Okay. And it'll it'll initially be making a small hole. Later we'll widen it. Mm-hmm. Um, but if 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 I'm not perfectly perpendicular with the square piece of steel, I'm gonna punch the hole in. If my angle is off a little bit, you know, say I'm like ten oh, degrees off to okay. the right or left. It's not, time it's it goes, not a 90 degree, basically. Yeah, if it's not perfect in 90 degrees, if it's if it's over to one side, it will uh, be really off at, by the time the steel goes all the way through and gets mm-hmm. to the bottom. So it's easy to screw up the hole. And if you screw up the hole, you just you, there's some ways to fix it, but in general, you got to start over. So let's get that out of the way first. We would go ahead and forge that. Um, and a, as a big a piece of steel as that is, I would need to bring in someone to swing a sledgehammer for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that we could work a little more f- quickly and more uh, efficiently. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you would you would, you know you get the you get the steel hot, set it up on the anvil. Uh, I would hold the steel with one hand with a pair of tongs, and I would have the punch in another pair of tongs, mm-hmm. and I'd have a striker who would who would hit it with the sledgehammer. Uh, and so we would slowly heat by heat punch through that giant piece of steel. It would probably take all day just to make the hole mm. and something as big as that uh if i'm doing a smaller hammer like like a regular forging hammer uh i could probably do two to three in a day once you get the hole done then you'll have another tool called a drift mm-hmm. and it'll be real narrow on the front end and it'll widen out to the final shape of whatever handle you're going to put it at the other end okay so it'll be like a long tapered bar and you send that through, mm-hmm. and that's what forces that narrow hole that you punched open wide and into the into the final shape. Ooh. Um, and sometimes you'll use maybe two or three different drifts because you'll have to. This there's so much mass there that you it moves so slowly that you have to do it in smaller increments. You can't just do it all at once. Now, if you had a power hammer like I was talking about before, you maybe could do it all because <laughs> it's got the strength, you know. It's hitting with the force of 25 tons or 50 tons instead of, you know, the weight of like a 16-pound sledgehammer. Oh, shit. Uh, yeah. So where was I? I don't know. You got to make the hole. That's the first yeah, thing. Yeah, make the hole from your nerve. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> make the hole and then, that, and then that I would shape the corners. You know, you have those nice beveled corners. I'd mm-hmm. hammer those in. Uh, and then I'd probably do some rune work on the side. What's, what's, uh, um, so I would, I would, I would carve some runes. Which runes? Uh, so those are the, those are the sigils that you see. Oh, uh, the, the, the Norse alphabet. Oh, okay. The, the, the language. Runes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I, the, didn't, I never knew what the actual word was. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. 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 So, uh, you know, they've got a whole alphabet just like we do. Mm-hmm. They call them runes. Uh, and they were semi mystical. I mean, it was a language. It was an alphabet you could mm-hmm. write your name with just like we would, but, um, like like back then, the alphabet and language was like magic. You know, not everybody knew how to write. Not mm-hmm. everybody knew how to read. And so it was well, – there was a lot more weight and purpose and, and, and you didn't just – you know, in some degrees, you didn't just write down anything. Like like words had power. And so, you know, we would we would carve some runes into it. Uh, definitely put Mjolnir. I think that what – what does it say? Like – Whosoever shall lift this, oh, wait, huh? Let me see whosoever can lift this hammer can have the might of Thor or something like that. Or if you're brave and true, I forget oh, what it said. Oh, we well, have to whoever put that will be worthy. Who can lift this? This is Mjolnir. Whoever shall be worthy, so have the power of Thor. Something like that. something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was like nobody could lift it. You know, he just had he could like set it on your chest and you'd be trapped forever. <laughs> It's actually pretty interesting because we were talking earlier about um, reading up on mythology. We were talking about Neil Gaiman's book. And um, he did a really good book on North, Norse mythology. He was able to bring all the tales together so one could hear it story. Uh, he talked about that Mjolnir 
I was able to grow in size too. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, something that something that a, po- a lot of people uh, who just know the comics mm-hmm. don't know about the real Thor, so to speak, <laughs> uh, is a lot of his. He had a magical belt as well that yeah, a lot of his strength, strength came from, right? And so it wasn't all in the hammer, <laughs> you know, like we think of from the comic books. But um, yeah, and and the real depictions of. Thor's hammer actually look very much like a blacksmith's hammer from that time. So it's, it's pr- fairly possible that blacksmiths reveal revered Thor, uh, you know, as their patron to a degree, mm. uh, you know, with, with the fire and lightning and striking sparks and things like that. Uh, you know, there's some connection there as well. <laughs> um, going back to uh, your production, production and style. Um, one thing I thought was interesting, like about sourcing the material. How do you source material for it? It's mostly online these days, really? you know. Um, there's a couple of companies that sell uh, tool grade steel, mm-hmm. so I can go to my local welding shop if I'm going to make something that's not going to be made into a tool, uh, and I can just I can and I prefer to do that because I can talk to people, I can look at the metal, um, because I'm forging and bending and, and, and changing the shape of the steel, I'm not as much concerned with uh, measuring. I, I do a lot of stuff by eye, um, but I know a few measurements, you know, mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll go in and walk around the, 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 the welding shop that I like to go to. And I'll look at the steel and I'll, okay, this is perfect for making fire pokers. Let me get two bars of that, you know, and I'll, I'll make a whole run of fire pokers this week. Uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe got a special project and I'll, I'll have it all measured out. Uh, but the tool steel is a little harder to find. It's a little more specialized. Mm-hmm. So generally I got to go online. There's a couple, couple companies I use, uh, and I can, can I name companies? Yeah, that's that fine. <laughs> so the big one for knife making is the New Jersey steel Baron. Okay. Uh, New Jersey he's, steel yeah, Baron. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's got a good reputation. The guy who runs it is named Aldo. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, I've never met him. I don't even think I've talked to him, but. In the knife making world, like when I first got started and I was, I was doing a lot of research on the internet and looking at, okay, who's making what, what kind of steel are they using? Why are they using that steel? Um, a lot of people would say, I made this blade from 1095. And then you'd get someone who said, I made this blade from Aldo's 1095. <laughs> and what, like, <laughs> somehow, like, right or wrong, or, or, you know, I don't, scientifically, is his metal any different from anybody else's? I couldn't tell you. But the reputation was there that this was someone who was selling good steel. Mm-hmm. So kind of when I twigged to that, I went, okay, that's the metal I'm going to buy then. You know what I mean? Like, it, like, if he's got the good reputation, that's what I want. I'm not interested in okay, who's got the cheapest? Who's got the best deal? Mm-hmm. That's like, if I, if that was my mindset, I, I shouldn't be a blacksmith, right? Yeah. Like you're, when you're looking at my stuff, you're not looking, oh, can I get that at Walmart cheaper? It's like, if you say that, you're not my customer. You go somewhere <laughs> else and that's fine. Go get your Walmart stuff. Go get your Walmart shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, and so as a, as a consumer of other people's goods and I, especially when I'm feeding my shop with the, the pro, you know, the the materials that I need to make my stuff, I'm not interested in what's cheapest. I'm in, interested in what's the best quality. So it seemed like the New Jersey Steel Baron had the good quality there, and so they they specialize in knife steels of all kinds, and uh, they're my first go to. Then there's a couple other uh, websites. Uh, what is it? Uh, uh, OnlineMetals.com, SpeedyMetals.com. There are a couple. <laughs> Uh, and they'll, they specialize in, uh, selling like smaller pit pieces, you know, not, not just for industrial applications to like car manufacturers or whatever, but they'll sell 10 feet of something. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's how I'll source it. Um, but you really gotta, you know, you gotta understand the metallurgy mm. and, and apply the right steel to the right purpose for the right purpose in the right project. So, um, especially when you're making tools and, and weapons and things. Uh, having that understanding is pretty important. One thing I just thought about while you are talking about the metal, the metal you use, I know there's a, there's a furnace and a kiln. A kiln is where you melt the metal, right? Or what, what, where do you melt the metal at? So 
as a blacksmith, I don't ever melt oh, okay. metal. I'm not I'm not liquefying anything. Um, I have a fire, and it's called a forge. All right. And so that could be named the name for the whole workshop. Mm-hmm. You know, like right now we're sitting in Crooked Path Forge. This is my forge. But also the specific table where the fire happens yeah. is, is a forge as well, right? So there's a little double meaning there. Um, and so you can have a gas forge. You can have a coal forge. Uh, most of my stuff is done in a coal forge. A little more traditional. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a little more control over the fire. Uh, there's a there's a whole list of reasons I really like it better. But uh, there's the smell and the... <laughs> You know, the interaction well, with it the, and everything. What's the main difference between propane or gas and uh, coal? So, uh, uh, gas is a little more expensive for me to run. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's a little easier to get the fuel because I just use the same gas tanks for your, your home, yeah. you know, gas stove or gas... Uh, barbecue. Barbecue, right. <laughs> um, but you run through it a lot quicker and it's like 40 bucks to fill up. Uh, so, it's more expensive. But gas is also easier for the beginner. The gas forge will get up to a certain temperature and mm-hmm. it'll stay there. And so you never risk uh, melting or burning your, your steel while you're working on it. Uh, with a coal forge, as long as you're feeding air into the fire, it's going to get hotter and hotter and hotter. It can get up to uh, 3,000 degrees or so, which is the melting point of, of iron. So if you're not careful in a coal forge, you can, you, know, you can have your metal in there. You could turn around, get a drink of water, turn back around, mm-hmm. and four hours of work is now just gone, Ooh. you know? Um, and so it's, it's at first it's risky, mm-hmm. you know, when you're, when you're learning, you really got to get used to losing stuff all the time, which I think is a real valuable lesson. Um, if you're getting into knife making or, or tool making, there's a thousand little points in the process where one mistake, you're done. You got to start over. You screwed <laughs> it all up. There's no going back. It's, it's, it's fucked. Um, and so, uh, that's a really valuable lesson to, to learn how not to fall in love with the project you're working on until you're finished, you know, because you lose it, especially (laughs) at the beginning, dude, you lose it. There are so many knives in these woods that I've just like (laughs) got pissed and chucked them and like, no, I'm done. I'm never going to do this again. 2000. 2,000 oh, years man. later, like, oh, look what we found. Look at these artifacts. <laughs> yeah, right. There's a battle here. Or a like, battle. Uh, Why is there so many knives? <laughs> what the hell is going on here? Yeah. Yeah, it's, you know. So the, the, but the, but the coal is more versatile. I can control the fire better. Mm-hmm. So I can heat it up faster. I can cool it down. I can make the fire larger if I'm working on something big. I can make the fire smaller if I'm working on something, you know, little. I can heat up, uh, a gas forge, just to describe it for the listeners, you know, uh, is, is sort of like a metal box with very thick insulation all around the outsides of the box. Okay. And there's uh, two little gas torches that come down, and it heats everything up inside this metal box Okay. that's insulated. Mm-hmm. So the, the problem is, is that you can only work on things that can fit inside the box. A coal forge is sort of a flat table with a little bowl mm-hmm. and... It, you make fire inside of the bowl, and so theoretically, I can fit almost anything into that into that box as long as I can get some part of it into that fire. I can heat and bend it, but it can be you know, it can be much larger than what can fit inside of a, a gas forge. So I, I feel like most professional blacksmiths mm-hmm. uh, use coal and use a coal forge. There are a lot of people who just do knives. And they might only ever use gas, and that's all they ever use because uh, knives fit easily inside of the box, and it's not another skill you have to learn. Um, I don't know if this is too much of a tangent, but no, no, it's, uh, it's really interesting. Uh, like, there's blacksmiths and there's bladesmiths, and there's some crossover, right? You can be both. There's nothing wrong with that, mm-hmm. um, but it's it's one aspect of blacksmithing that you can specialize in. And only do that and and still potentially make a living only making knives. Yeah. Because knives are so collectible. They're so fascinating. People do it all the time. And there's different, uh, there's different uh, variations of knives. There's, so. Oh, man. There's different a million uses. different. Yeah. Right? Like <laughs> even inside of making knives, there are people who just make kitchen knives. Or well, hunting you know? knives. Or just make hunting knives. Or right. Right. Wood cutting kni- There's wood cutting. Or, yeah, there's wood sure, cutting knives. There right? are wood cutting knives. There's, there's, you can just get into one culture. Mm-hmm. There are plenty of people who only do Japanese style blades. You know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, and they like they sell their stuff for way too much money, but you know, like 
People buy it. Uh, they, <laughs> yeah, you know, there's a whole, like, if you build up a name and a reputation, you can start charging more, of course, and all that. Um, but so you can really, you can really specialize in knife making. And so then your shop would be geared to just making knives. And you might have a different kind of shop with a different tool set than what I do. Mm-hmm. Um, I love making knives. I'll always make knives. But I don't want to stick to one thing. I want to stay versatile. I feel like anytime I learn a new uh, a skill that is, a, say, maybe a learning how to make a gate mm-hmm. or learning how to do a new kind of decorative twist, it, it, in, it, it's a new skill. But it, 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 I find a way that it goes back and helps me with my knife making and with my tool making. So uh, I, I, I think it's weird that people will pigeonhole themselves into that one thing. Uh, I really like to. I like to have well-rounded skills. I guess you know. <laughs> well, that's that's kind of like of a someone wants to challenge themselves. Uh, you can still challenge yourself by making one type of uh, say if you just want to stick with knives. Mm-hmm. Like, man, maybe I want to make this type of knife or that type of knife. But it's also the same thing. It's like, no, I want to try and make a uh, make an armor now, some type of armor. Yeah. Or uh, some type of sword, or something like that. Right, right, yeah, and I, I, as a craftsman, I think it's important to push yourself. Like if if I'm if I'm doing the same thing day in and day out, I mean, a I just I get bored. Mm-hmm. Uh, but 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 b I um I'm, I'm gonna lose something. You know what I mean? I'm gonna lose that 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 edge that that sort of hunger for more. You know, to better. You like every knife I make is better than the last knife I made. And I always want it to be that way. You know what I mean? Like I don't ever, I do very little production knives. Like I, I don't make 50 of the same knife. Oh, okay. I don't even make one of the same knife. <laughs> you know, there, there are some shapes and styles that I do more often, but I don't have like a cardboard cutout or a wood cutout of, of a blank that I try to match everything to. Nothing's uniform. It's all eyeballed. It's each one in, even if they look the same, like there, you'll find differences because each one is done, you know, from scratch by hand, you know. Um, so that's part of I don't know where I was going there, but that's I don't know. No, I want to do something new and different. That's yeah. what it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so I try to push myself. I try to I try to keep keep on that edge, uh, and then I have to stay better than my students, right? That's so true. <laughs> I, I I get students who come in who really also get the fire, and they start wanting to do it too. And I'm always like, oh, man, if you're coming to learn from me, I better make sure I'm <laughs> I'm better than you, <laughs> you know, or not better, but, you know, that I have more skills and experience and that I, like, you know, there comes a point when the master, the teacher is better than the master mm-hmm. and that uh, that's fine. I'd love to see that happen. But, yeah. But uh, it's like um, one thing I, where did I read it? I don't know. I think it's a, some type of Eastern philosophy. That a wise man is always a student, like he's always learning. I like that. Yeah, that's you have to. Um, I, as an example, and and by no means am I a master mm-hmm. at the craft by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but just recently in October, there's a, a blacksmithing club in Florida. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, we're, we're called FABA, the Florida Artist Blacksmith Association. Oh wow. And man, they've been a really great help to to me learning my craft and skills. Uh, but we had our yearly conference in October, and every year we invite uh, other full time blacksmiths to come and demonstrate and teach. And so uh, this gentleman by the name of Walter Sorrels, who's a well known blade maker, uh, and he specializes in Japanese style knives, mm-hmm. and uh, he came to teach a class. And so at this conference, I taught a knife making class. I've been teaching it there for the last four years. Um, and so, but then after I taught my class the next day, I went and took his knife making class. <laughs> and so absolutely. Yeah. It's like, you know, you always have to be learning and, and maybe, maybe I knew I wasn't going to learn a huge amount. I ended up learning quite a bit from mm-hmm. him, but I knew he had a different style and just learning from somebody else's perspective you always are going to find insight. Yeah, you're always going to find some some better, maybe a better way of making a process um, better uh, or another way of uh, or a different technique you could use or a solution to a problem that 
you you've been racking your mind about for like months and the guy like no oh, yeah i already solved that one <laughs> like, oh wait great great yeah, how'd yeah, you solve exactly. it exactly <laughs> oh yeah you don't want to try to reinvent the wheel uh it's it's something i see a lot too uh especially on the internet there's you know there's these different forums where people are trying to learn blacksmithing and i tell them first thing i tell them is go find a blacksmith and learn from them mm-hmm. like a uh, hundred hours of watching youtube is you'll learn more in 20 minutes with somebody who really knows what they're doing. And you actually uh, have to do it too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so much of it is the practice and just the muscle memory. Um, but if you, if you, if you build in wrong muscle memory, if you build in bad habits, they're mm-hmm. really hard to get out. And that's, that's what learning from somebody does. Um, yeah. I forget where I was going with that too, but uh, no, yeah. Yeah. A lot of these episodes, <laughs> we go down rabbit holes. Like sure. it's Especially your stuff that's really interesting, where it's like, ah, oh, fuck it, let's go down the rabbit hole. Cool. Let's let's keep learning something yeah, new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Well, we actually, what was the original question I asked you? Like it was like ten minutes ago. I oh, yeah. asked you the original coal, question. Oh, coal versus gas. Yeah, coal right? versus gas. Coal versus gas. But that, that was a rabbit hole that led from another <laughs> rabbit hole. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, because I asked me how. Um, the process, sorting. The pro- yeah, the process, like getting them, because I thought you melted the metal for some reason. Because, like I said, right, I, yeah. I, I don't know that much about blacksmithing. Yeah. So you don't melt it; you just get it soft. Right. You heat it up, and it softens as it gets hotter. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it also glows as it gets hotter. And the brighter it glows, the softer it is, mm-hmm. uh, and the easier it is to move under your hammer. Uh, so, so if you're melting steel. Uh, you know, that's a whole nother process. That's a, you, you, you heat things. It's called a foundry is mm-hmm. the name of the workshop. Um, and you may still have a forge. You may have a kiln or a furnace. Mm-hmm. A lot of times they use the word furnace. Um, and there's probably people who could quibble, quibble about terminology and whatnot. But uh, for a blacksmith, yeah, you're not really melting the steel. You're just heating it up to soften it. And then you, you hammer it into your shapes. So I think of it a lot like Play-Doh. Uh, and in fact, you can practice your forging technique with Play-Doh. Really? And and it'll act very similar. How so? Um, when you hit it with a hammer. Well, I mean, that's literally like uh. uh so the, the metal is kind of like the same same uh, texture as uh, Play-Doh. At yeah, Cedar, right? yeah, a little harder than Play-Doh will be. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what I can do, like, say, if I hit Play-Doh twice with a hammer, mm-hmm. I might have to hit the hot steel seven or eight times with the hammer okay but it it moves in the same way oh and and so since you're like um when you're forging you know you're hitting with your hammer uh you're it's not like carving or grinding where you're removing material the you hit it with a hammer and it gets thin in one dimension but that metal has to go somewhere and so it gets wider or thicker or it it alters in some other dimension whenever you hit it so sometimes it can move in unexpected ways if you're not familiar with with what's going on, and so it's a good idea sometimes to practice a new technique with clay uh, or play-doh or something like that, so that um, you know as I hit it here, I can see all oh, the metals the metals moving in this direction, and I, I need to plan to counteract that. Um, I mean, I say that a lot, and I know people do it. I actually have never used clay or play-doh to practice. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like I've heard people suggest it or whatever, yeah. but... I, I, well, and part of it is because I have the forge, and so what I what do I practice on? I practice on metal, mm-hmm. you know? And if I, if I... A lot of times, like, if I do a commission, and I've never made this thing before, I'll make three. And then whichever one seems best or seems closest to what the customer had in mind will be the one I use. And if the other two are sellable, great. If they're not, you know, it was a learning experience. And, I, you know, maybe I just use it in my own shop or I chuck it or I don't know what I do with it. I give it away to somebody. Um, the better I get at the craft, the less often my seconds and thirds are like total garbage. You know what I mean? And, and a lot of times, if it's just a new kind of axe I've never made uh, or a new kind of knife I've never made, they're, they're almost all perfectly fine you know and i just i just pick whichever one strikes my fancy <laughs> uh or i'll take a picture sometimes and show it to the customer go oh which one which one do you like best and they go oh yeah i like that one all right cool <laughs> so that's that's part of that uh yeah uh because you, you we keep talking about steel do you use any type of other metals for myself mm-hmm. uh not to forge 
And forging is the process of heating, mm-hmm. hammering, changing the shape. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I like to use copper a lot oh. in uh, the furniture of on my blades. So mm-hmm. like the guard or the pommel or some of the smaller metal, what's, what's metal elements that make up the handle. So the pommel is the backside, the butt at mm-hmm. the end of the handle. Okay. Uh, and so like in a sword, the pommel will have some weight to kind of counteract oh. and balance a blade. Yeah. Uh, for, a, for a regular knife, it's not usually so much about balance. Mm-hmm. I mean, it can be. Um, but it just gives you something solid. So like, I don't know, you, if you accidentally drop your knife, it's going to, if it hits butt first, it's not going to hit on the wood and splinter your wood handle. It's got that metal guard to protect it. Um, so I like to use copper. It's a, it's pretty. And, <laughs> yeah, it's a nice uh, little add-on to it, a nice yeah. little decoration to it. Yeah, so like rivets and things like that, I'll use copper. Uh, you can forge, you can forge some other some other metals. You can forge copper. You can forge bronze. Um, you can forge uh, silver, even. Mm. Although a lot of that is is not done hot. It's done cold. Really? Uh, because it's not a ferrous metal. It's a it's a different process. What's a ferrous metal? So ferrous metal is anything that is made primarily of steel or of iron, rather. Mm-hmm. So steel, which is iron and carbon. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, stainless steel, which is going to have chromium in it. Um, certain certain other metals that have uh, like tungsten and molybdenum mm-hmm. added into <laughs> it. It's always a hard one for me to pronounce. Uh, you know, alloys are anything that's just not straight iron. Mm-hmm. Um, so anything that's got that ferrous, it's going to be magnetic as well, right, usually. Uh, and those are all forgeable steels. And then you have non-ferrous metals. Which is, uh, like I said, you know, any any gold, silver, uh, copper, tin, brass, bronze. Mm-hmm. Um, bronze is the only one I know of that you can forge hot as well. Uh, but those are trickier. They melt faster. They have a smaller window yeah. um, between getting hot enough to be able to hammer on to shape it before it actually melts. And so that's one of the interesting things about iron is that it, it's so perfect for what we need it for. Uh, It has this wide, long window of forgeability (laughs) where you can hammer on it and actually get something done. It has the strength to, uh, you know, not just make weapons, but to make structural elements to, Mm. you know, have buildings and to be axles for wagons and, (laughs) uh, you know, all the varied things that we need it to do. It can can really uh, very versatile metal. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of fascinating to me. What would you say is your uh, your most favorite um, item you worked on? Something that comes like near dear to your heart? Yeah, yeah. The, there's there's been a couple like there's a there was a sax that I made, and so a, a, a sax is a particular kind of knife mm-hmm. used by the Saxons, which that's how they got their name, mm-hmm. or maybe that's how the knife got its name. It's yeah, unclear, it, right? It go either way. <laughs> but it was their signature blade, right? And the Saxons are very similar to the Vikings. Uh, they traveled from Germany and, and, and wound their way over into uh, England, which is where we get Anglo-Saxons from. But anyway, it's a, it's sort of a larger fighting knife. It would have been a backup weapon. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, I, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I made it. I used some driftwood for the handle from uh, the beach I grew up in, Mm -hmm. uh, in Florida here. And uh, I used some salt to kind of etch, some salt water to etch the blade. And it was was beautiful. And uh, for the longest time, I had it priced like really high because I didn't want to sell it. I wanted to keep it. (laughs) And uh, I would wear wear it to like the medieval fair and things like that. And um, I kind of, I eventually backed down the price a little bit, but I still had it not really priced to sell. Mm -hmm. And just recently I I was at a craft show and somebody fell in love with it and they wanted it. And so, uh, you know, I had to let it go. And I think that's good though. That means, that means now I want to make another one (laughs) and maybe it'll, you know, it'll be better, better, you know? Right. Uh, I also have an ax that I probably won't ever sell. Uh, I named it hack (laughs) and I, I really love hack the ax too. I've, I've used it on the, the farm here to cut down trees and, (laughs) Uh, trim things and just finding out how versatile that sort of bearded axe shape uh, where part of the blade comes down a little bit. Um, I don't know. It's cool. It's just, it's it, to me, it's really neat to make the tool mm-hmm. and then use it and find out, Oh, that's why it's that shape. Like this is how they would have done this it. Is, you know? This is why 
it's not for uh it's not for looks like oh there's a functionality to it yeah yeah it's cool to discover that you know and i'm sure other people know it and could have told me but by using it you figure it out you know there's a there's an intimacy there between you and the tool that um you know i think a lot of people don't get anymore Mm -hmm. you know what i mean like how many people have a favorite axe or a favorite hammer i really understand like how to use that tool uh that's a neat connection yeah i have a um axe at home i use sometimes to chop down some brush or wood Uh, yeah some brush or wood it's like eh, i'm starting to like it but it's a wooden handle but the head is starting to come off the actual handle itself Mm -hmm. then i have a sledgehammer with a that tape around the handle, so that way you don't get blisters. I use it sure, for work. Yeah. I use it for working out. I just hit tires with it. <laughs> yeah, also, yeah. And then I also use it too if I need to break something down or yeah, need to destroy something. Like all right, yeah, it's yeah. time to get the sledgehammer. It's good therapy too. Yeah. You know, it's something, it's something. It feels something. It feels very cathartic. Yeah. Oh yeah. And having that, I like having that connection with it too. I is is is. I don't know. You get to know it. Yeah. You know. So. If you ever want to come by here and swing a sledgehammer, dude, I do. You'd be welcome. You'd be welcome, <laughs> dude. I want to. Man. I'll bring yeah, my sledgehammer. Yeah. Like, yeah, let's do it. I want. Make, I want to make something badass. <laughs> it's fun, and that's that's part of it too. Like, uh, sometimes I've I've talked here. Sometimes I'll say I make something all by myself, mm-hmm. and a lot of the bigger projects I don't. I make. I have to have somebody in here, and I think there was this myth. At least there was when I grew up. And like read about it and you think of like dwarves forging in their, you know, mm-hmm. in their forge or like the village blacksmith and you picture it's like one dude yeah. and he's hanging out by himself making stuff. And in real life, the blacksmith's shop was cutting edge technology. It was a factory in a lot of senses. And, you know, it was, it was, it was a business. It was always a business. Yeah. Right. And so you have. You know, you have like a small shop, like a farm, like a big farm or ranch would have its own little blacksmith shop mm-hmm. where you might tinker around repair tools and things like that. But the actual blacksmith shop would have been something that had, you know, anywhere from five to 15 to 20 to 100 employees. And each blacksmith shop would specialize in a certain thing. Mm. They would not necessarily be generalists. You know, they might be uh, cutlers. They do scissors. They do shears. They do scythes. You know, you would have wheelwrights that just did axles and wheels for wagons um they specialize you know there wasn't so there was a little bit of a myth about that anyway Mm -hmm. and so for me understanding like how much better and how much cooler stuff you can do when you bring someone else into the shop with you you just have a second hand to hold something while you use a chisel and hammer to shape it you know you have someone who can swing a sledgehammer so that you can break down a big, heavy piece of steel into something smaller and more manageable. Uh, it really, like, I don't know, it changes the game. You get a different feel for the process. And, um, well, I don't know. It's, um, it's like anything else in life. Like, it, things are better if you can share it with another person. I think so, yeah. It's like, like everything else. Like, also, um, uh, yeah, this is this is just, just better. Yeah, it's just better in general. Like, yeah, no, I have my friend helping me out. We're doing this together. We're b- making this big ass project together. Yeah, yeah. And when you're, you know, I don't, I, you have another brain around that helps troubleshooting. Yeah, and, that, you know, that practical too. Practical matters like that. It's, re- I think it's really nice. It's always good to have a second set of eyes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you know, you build up some camaraderie. Like, I'm actually, I'm wearing this uh, this sh- t-shirt today. <laughs> the, the back says the Brotherhood bearded. Uh, oh, the bearded brotherhood of blacksmiths. The bearded brotherhood of blacksmiths. <laughs> and so there's a couple guys locally here, and we've just kind of started getting together and uh, decided, hey, let's like, they really f- decided on it and invited me in. But uh, you know, it's just this, it's a little blacksmithing club here. It's just five or six guys. We get together, and every time we get together, maybe every two or three months, we decide on a project and mm-hmm. we work towards building it. And uh, you know. When we when we get done for the day, we crack open the beer, and have cook out, and you know it's a it's a it's a it's a nice like it's a it's a great way for us to like I don't I don't know like like have a club. Mm-hmm. I, I don't, people want to have clubs. They want to feel like they've got this 
cool secret shit that they do, you yeah. know? And and it's a camaraderie. Yeah, yeah. There's there's something there that that is uh yeah, that that I like a lot, you know. <laughs> we all we all dig it. We're all kind of like-minded dudes. So. What's uh what big projects do you guys work on? So the first thing we did, we this will be we'll be meeting for the third time. Mm-hmm. So the first two times we met, uh we made bells. Oh, uh, wow. And and like a little holder and then a, a I don't know, we called it a donger, but the, <laughs> the metal the, bit that you hit, you hit the, the bell with to make the sound. How big was the bell? Um, so the first one was only maybe about a foot tall mm-hmm. and about, I don't know, two inches around. Okay. It was kind of a long, thin bell. Uh, okay. Like a, like a chime, not chime. A little chimey. Yeah. yeah, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, a, um, you know, we started with a pipe mm-hmm. when we forged it out. And then the second one was a little more ambitious. It was a four inch round mm-hmm. pipe that was maybe a foot and a half tall. It was a lot bigger. Uh, and we set that to, um, I mentioned the, the FABA blacksmithing club mm. for all of Florida. We had our conference and there's an auction and everybody makes something for the auction and it's to raise money for the club. And so we made the bell to be auctioned off. And, uh, I think we were all super surprised. I went for a 450 bucks. <laughs> we were like, oh, holy <laughs> shit. All right. Let's, let's go make another one. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> another one. Uh, but that, you know, that was fun. I think the next thing we're going to do is, uh, we're going to go to a new guy's shop and we're going to make a, uh, sort of a, a stylized Viking long ship Ooh, out oh, of metal. Wow. Yeah. And so that's like, going to be it, real is exciting. Is it actually going to be the scale or? No, no, uh, no. It'll be a model. Cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. Oh, geez. That scale. would take forever. <laughs> yeah. No. And, and, and this might even, this will certainly take more than the one day. Um, but we'll have a little dragon head on the front that we'll have to forge. Mm. Uh, there, there'll be a keel that goes down the, you know, the bottom, for yeah. the, sort of the, the, the backbone, spine. yeah, the yeah. backbone. Uh, and then we'll have a couple bars riveted from the front of the keel to the back to kind of give you the idea of the shape of the, you know, the walls mm-hmm. of the ship. And then there'll be a mast with mm-hmm. a, I don't know how we'll do the sail. We might do a piece of leather or. Oh, that'd uh, be cool. Canvas. Yeah, yeah, maybe some canvas or something. I don't know. Yeah, we'll figure that out when we get so there. Cool. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so cool. Yeah, you know, yeah. You know, you make these cool things. Yeah. You're like, all right. So I think we're going to try to do two for that one as well. One to sell and one to have. Uh, yeah, so that that should be fun. But yeah, that, having other people around, man, it really it's really nice. It really helps. What um, Do you have any dream projects? Like something that like you really want to make one day? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, what do I really want to make one day? <laughs> I mean, there's shorter term practical stuff that, uh, like, I, I, I want to make a helmet. I haven't made a helmet yet. Uh, like a Viking style. Mm. Um, they call them Spangen helms. Um, I do want to make a sword one day. And maybe we'll talk about swords a little more later. Uh, I've got a bit of a love hate relationship with them. Why is that? <clears throat> so, so a sword. As opposed to say an axe or a spear mm-hmm. or a bow and arrow or other kinds of weapons, yeah, um, a sword is the only one that's specifically designed to murder other human beings, okay. right? Like an axe, you might have an axe that's meant as a weapon and designed as a weapon, but it's it it started life as a tool, a tool, right? And then it then it, we converted it into a weapon. <laughs> Same with a spear, you know, and, and that axe might still be good at cutting wood. You know, mm-hmm. the spear is good for hunting. Yes. Um, but the sword, it is, it is so, purely a human killing machine mm-hmm. and it's super efficient at it. And so like there's, that's an interesting concept and it's not like I'm squeamish or anything weird like that, but it's, I don't know. There's something about it that is a little more intimidating to my mind when I go to think about making one, um, and then there's there's also just the just the the challenge of it uh, is it's different because it's not just making a large knife. Uh, there's a there's a reverberation aspect. There's a weight and balance aspect. Uh, you know when you strike with a particularly long sword, anyway, mm-hmm. uh, it when it hits it vibrates right all the way down the steel. Yeah, and that vibrate vibration takes a, a waveform like a sound wave. Mm-hmm. Right. And it, and it wiggles back and forth and there's going to be these two nodes, sometimes three nodes, depending on how long it is. Right. 
where um, that sound wave pivots. Okay. If that makes sense. You're so talking you, about it. The, is the nodes in the hilt of the sword? Or? Well, it should be in the hilt of the sword. Mm-hmm. If you balance the blade correctly, that stable point where the wave kind of pivots on uh, will be where your hand is. And then when you hit something, uh, everything feels nice and normal. Mm-hmm. But if you've if you've messed up and you've got the wave where your hand is, where the the sort of the up and down portion of the wave where mm-hmm. it goes up and down. Is where your hand, if you hit something and your, your body yeah. vibrates and you go, boy, 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 <laughs> and it feels, it wants to jump out of your hand. Uh, and so when, when you really get into the craftsman aspect of it and you're really interested and serious about making a real sword and not just a piece of metal that looks like a sword, that's the thing that sort of separates the, the master from an apprentice, really. Um, so I'll get there one day. <laughs> <laughs> and i think this coming year i'll probably start making some shorter swords where that's not as much of an issue yeah I'll work my way up to it um but dream like big dream stuff that i would like to make oh man i saw you know i, I don't know that i have anything really? i think i i think i it's like whatever comes to mind that i yeah i well and i I try to just take it one day at a time, you know, and, and, and not get too far ahead of myself. Um, I have dreams for like new tools to have in the shop, you know, new processes like that. But, uh, so you could go bigger and better. Yeah. Yeah. You know, more complex. I mean, there's, there's, there's Damascus to think about. Uh, and I do make some Damascus. What's Damascus again? So Damascus is, uh, alternating layers of different kinds of steel. Hmm. Technically, you should call it pattern welded steel, mm-hmm. uh, but I don't like to quibble about terminology. <laughs> Everybody says Damascus. When I say Damascus, people know what I mean. Uh, and so it's alternating layers of steel that's folded. So you start to get, you know, 80 layers, 100 layers, maybe 800 layers. Uh, and then you, uh, you alter those patterns, you alter those layers in different ways to create shapes and patterns. And you forge it back out, you make it into a knife. And then when you etch it with an acid, the different types of steel will etch differently. And so some steel, you want to have something that has a lot of nickel Mm -hmm. in it, a very high nickel content. That steel will stay shiny. And then you have something that has no nickel in it, and that steel will get dark. And so you'll get this alternating layer of of shiny and dark steel. And since you've, you know, like say you took a bar that was 80 layers, all perfectly flat, one on top of each other. You made it square. And then you heated it up and you twisted it. All that steel, like all that strata, like a, like a sedimentary layers, like in the earth, right? Mm-hmm. It's all now. It's all been twisted and 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 made a different shape. Then when you grind that out, that's going to reveal a pattern in those segments, and that's gonna that's gonna give you your you know your sort of pattern. And so there's all different kinds of different patterns you can make with the steel Ooh. they have different names ladder <laughs> damascus raindrop damascus feather damascus like there's there's a whole it's a whole rabbit hole like you could just get into making damascus and nothing else and may almost make a living doing that what, what, what would you use the damascus for so you use that to make knives and blades okay. and it's really just a way of adding uh, uh decoration and, and pattern to the steel um there's a lot of myth around it. People think that doing all the folding strengthens the steel, makes mm-hmm. it stronger. And and really compared to modern steel, mm-hmm. it's all the same. Okay. I mean, it's, you know, in general, it's all the same strength. Uh, there's pros and cons in different kinds of steel and all this kind of stuff we could talk about. But um, a Damascus Bowie knife is not going to be inherently any stronger than a solid one steel Bowie knife. As long as all the heat treats done the same, you're going to be good to go. Bowie knife. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, I don't know, that's, playing around with Damascus would be fun. Damascus. Yeah. Now, um, going back to what we were talking about before the podcast, your, one of the things that kind of inspired you, too, is your heritage. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I'm, 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 I'm kind of an even mix Mm -hmm. of german and english uh my last name borstelman is very german yeah Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. and i was you know i was lucky enough to know 
uh, uh, get to know um, two sets of great grandparents mm-hmm. who had both grown up and lived most of their lives in Germany and then had moved to the States uh, just after World War II. And so uh, it was it was real fascinating, like like getting to know them and having them in my life. And then, um, I don't know, like, I see a lot of people, uh, there's some, there's some folks who like really get into like a Japanese style and they, they love the Japanese culture, Mm -hmm. but they themselves are not Japanese. And so like, and that's fine for you. Like Mm -hmm. you follow your heart, everybody's got their own soul and it's going to take them in whatever direction it's going to take them. But for me, if I got real getting into something that I couldn't trace back to my own heritage would Mm -hmm. feel a little false. Yeah. Uh, it's not it's not in your own history. Yeah, yeah. And so so that's why I kind of drew towards especially the Saxons because they went from Germany to England. And so that was like that was part of a period in history called the Great Migration. And um it's a lot of Celtic uh stuff going on there, but a lot of like that Norse, like they were the culture that started to blend those two things together. Mm-hmm. Um and they started out pagan and then they became Christian. And so that's an interesting transformation as well in, in their history. And, uh, so for me, I really like, I don't know. I'm really drawn to that. I like the runes. They look cool. <laughs> yeah, like, that, that's yeah, part of it too. That's a cool looking language. Yeah. Though. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, and so I like, I don't try, I don't fool myself into thinking that like, I try not to get too serious about it, you know? And it's like, at its heart, it looks fucking cool. Yeah. So like, that's kind of why <laughs> I do it to start with. And then learning the history and the, and everything behind it, like, to me makes it more real. And so I like having that connection. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, I don't know, like that's something, something I, I think about and, and I, I don't know, I pull my inspiration from, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. We're talking about also too. You live on a nice little small farm here with your, yeah. your boards and your wife, um, you and your wife make mead, right? Or used to make mead. We do still, still yeah, yeah, yeah. We still make the mead. Um, she has bees, and, and we raise the. Yeah, where's bees. the bees at? Because I, I oh, don't they're hear far them. away. Okay, yeah, 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 like, yeah, I don't yeah, hear yeah. them. <laughs> We've got so it's ten acres. There's a there's a another section over here, uh, you know, off to the side here, mm-hmm. and they're they're far enough away that they don't they don't harass anybody. Mm-hmm. And not that they're like killer bees or like whatever. They're you know there's yeah, bees, but. Um, it's better to keep them away from the animals. You know, the dogs don't understand mm-hmm. and they'd start sniffing around and licking some honey if it's dripping oh, out and then we attack the trouble. hive. Yeah, and... yeah. But, uh, yeah. So, you know, we, we, she's got a garden. She loves growing things. And so, uh, she does, a, she does all of that stuff. I'm not very, I don't have much of a green thumb. <laughs> um, but yeah, meat is, meat is part of the, that Norse I never, heritage and I, that Norse I don't think I've never drank meat well. before. Uh, no, well, we haven't. might we might crack open a bottle <laughs> crack here open. afterwards okay. if you're interested. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd say so. We could do that. I'm a connoisseur of uh, liquor and wine. Yeah. Not a beer awesome. drink. I'm not a big. I'm not a beer drinker, but I yeah, love yeah. trying new things. Like, oh, let me try well, this. this is, you know, meat is fermented honey, <laughs> mm, and love, and that's honey, really yeah, honey. yeah. That's what it is. It is hard, and it could be sweet. It could be dry. You mm. know, it's the it's a little more like wine in the way you ferment it. You want to you want to give it a long time. Like mm-hmm. beer, you can you can start and stop inside of a month and have like a bunch of beer. Um, but me, you know, you want it to age and as it ages, it changes, you know, flavors and, and, and whatnot. And so, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. We like, <laughs> we like making mead. We like making mead. It's like a nice little farm too. I always want to live like this, like some, some place a little bit outside of a city, but also where I have my own land. It's quiet. Mm-hmm. It's nice. Except for I, I was thinking about getting a silver silver stream. Uh, oh yeah, what, the, the airstream. Yeah, airstream. There yeah. we go. The airstream. That'd like be a, awesome, man. So I could bring my house with me wherever I travel. Well, yeah, especially <laughs> because you're collecting the stories. That would be yeah, that's that's really the, perfect. That's the big goal for me. That um, that I actually get to do that. I'll buy, make get the money enough, buy an airstream, have a small couple acres of land. Yeah. Then when I want to go across the country, go to Canada or go to Mexico, I'm like man, I don't need a hotel. This yeah, perfect. <laughs> Chain it up to the back of my car. Like, all right, let's go. There you go, man. Bring my yeah, house yeah. with me. Yeah, that's funny. I, you know, I, I like to travel, but I, I, I'm, I don't, I, I don't move around a lot. You know, like vacations are fun, but mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not somebody who has to. Like, I'm, 
my wife and I both, we set roots down and, <laughs> we, you know, here Gainesville is kind of where we say we live, even though we're a little outside of town. Yeah, it's only like 10 miles, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's perfect because we're out here in the country. Mm-hmm. People leave us alone. We can kind of do our own thing. Uh, it's quiet. And then if we do need to go into town because we want to go party or we want to hit a bar, or we want to, you know, eat dinner or mm-hmm. whatever, we, we've got that. Yeah. You know? and it's like you the best the of both worlds, you know? Uh, and also for the business, I'm close enough to the University of Florida, um, and the turnover of population is that's true. Is constant, that is cycling. smart. Yeah, so I get a lot of students coming in, you know, that are trying to just do something cool on the weekend. It's not, you know, just partying and drinking and stuff. And so they, you know, I have a nice little rotating population of of potential students you, that come out. Do you ever have classes. bachelor parties here? Like guys who come out, like, yeah, let's do this, let's do this for a bachelor. You event. know, I offer it. I haven't had one. I'm yeah, really a cool fucking bachelor event. Yeah, though. yeah. Like, let's make, let's make something that we can actually you know take with us. Mm-hmm. Well, and I do a bottle opener class mm-hmm. uh, usually around October for Oktoberfest, <laughs> where we make the bottle openers and then we hang out and we have you know I have a six pack of beer mm-hmm. and we get to open our beers with our bottle openers. Um, and I did have there was a there was a lady who was um, going to a wedding. She was one of the bridesmaids mm-hmm. and as a gift to the bride and groom and also for all the other people that were in the wedding party, she came over and we made bottle openers for the entire wedding party and, you know, put a little date, the date of the wedding on mm-hmm. the back, you know, with a chisel. And, uh, that was a pretty fun experience, but I had one person ask about a bachelor party. And when, when I told them it was all oh, like, this is going to be a four hour event. Oh. They were like, oh yeah, that's a little too long. <laughs> we were hoping to like get an hour and then, you know, go hit the clubs and. So the yeah, it's not a fast process. I think well, that's probably part of that. It was better than the my friend's bachelor party. Yeah, um, it was fun. Except for the next day, we went fishing uh, off of Miami. Oh yeah, and uh, this is why I used to work on a cruise ship. And I didn't. I never had seasickness before. But I guess from all the drinking the night before, <laughs> and <laughs> like. As soon as we got on a boat, I started throwing up. Oh, I, man. I had to go sit inside, and even sitting inside, I was throwing up in a trash can. Yeah, yeah. I thought, man, this is how I'm going to die. I'm surrounded <laughs> by almost all white guys. And <laughs> <laughs> but as soon as we docked uh, on the ship, I got got back on land. It's like, oh, wait. <laughs> no more seasick. Yeah, that was good. Was like, oh, Just like that. Now. Yeah. That's funny. I was like, I, I never got the fist either. I was oh, on a boat man, throwing up the whole time. Yeah, that sucks. <laughs> oh, man. All right, we're going to go to the question part okay. of the um, interview. Sure. For anybody that's a new listener, and thank you guys for the returning listeners, I asked this part, I asked these questions at the other half of the episodes because I want to show people another side of a person too the reason why i ask these questions also is that i have a various types of people on the show from different backgrounds different jobs different mindsets maybe the best example i had or two best examples i had was a former clansman and i had a prostitute on the show so <laughs> but the yeah. reason why i ask these questions is that you could disagree with a person's life lifestyle or their choices but also too you could relate to a person to a certain level. And I kind of want to show the world that it's okay to disagree with a person, but you could always relate to that person too. And that's what's kind of needed now. Uh, empathy. So these questions yeah. are, some of them are fun and some of them are serious, but they reveal more about the person I am interviewing. So do you do, are these the same questions you ask every... Well, basically, there's 30... Two questions on here, but I don't ask all of them. Mas- gotcha. I average around 10 questions, so I pick and choose. Cool. Because there's some interviews where they answer some of the questions while we're doing the first half of the episode. Sure, right. And other other times I like to mix it up, too. Nice. So I'll, I usually have the same four or five core questions. Then I go pick random questions, too, off the list. So it's interesting, too. And then also we have more conversations while we're talking. Mm-hmm. So it's more revealing, also. So we'll start off with a fun one, the one I I seem to go to with. <laughs> Given the choice of anyone in the world from any time period, who would you want as a dinner guest, and why? All right. You know, you know who I would want. <laughs> mm. 
I think I would probably want um, Bodica or Who's Boudica. Bo- Who's that? So she was a uh, she was a warrior queen of the Celtic people, and uh, one of the like one of the very few like you know prominent warrior women in, in a culture dominated by men. Mm-hmm. And um, she fought the Romans, and I would just I would just be. I would just be fascinated to talk to somebody like that. You know what I mean? Like, like what, like, what is your life like? Like do what you're doing to me, you know, mm-hmm. to somebody who's yeah, it's like lived in a, in a, in a, a <laughs> culture and an environment that like so much, so much of my like childhood fantasies were about, you know? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, she, she, so her husband was killed by the Romans. He was like a prominent chief. Mm-hmm. And then she just, she just got pissed. Let's see what and, shit. <laughs> oh man, she organized this, you know, this army. She brought it together, and she they like rebelled against the Romans, and it was like a really big fight. And of course, they lost because that, you know, cause mm-hmm. that's how it went down. But uh, you know, they won some smaller skirmishes, and there was like some build up, and then they had a big battle. But she drove a chariot and like fought and was feared and. So just, I mean, just meeting so, like such a fascinating person and, uh, you know, j- also just being able to find out what life was like in those times. It's something that a lot of my, a lot of the things I make and build are, are around that time as well. And so, I don't know, just that's, that's part of my fascination with all this is understanding what life was like back then. Um, so I think, yeah, I think the Warrior Queen Bodega would be. Bodega. Yeah. I, I think I've heard that name before. And I can't remember it's from if it was from Dan Carlin's uh, Hardcore History. It may very or, well have been. Or Comedy Central's uh, Drunk History. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever seen that show? Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. Drunk That's history. a fun one. I love that one. <laughs> it's, like, it, yeah. like, it's pretty cool because yeah. then later I look up the history stuff like, oh, yeah. It's pretty legit. Did, yeah. Like, they did a good job telling the story. It made it, made it funny, but the, the facts were true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Drunk History. That's a fun like oh, con- concept. Like, all right, we'll get you drunk. <laughs> you go tell a story. <laughs> And it then we have famous actors act out what you say. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's a great format. I like it a lot. That's uh, yeah, it's good. And I, Dan Carlin is great too. I listen to him. Uh, I like his. I don't know his voice. Just the cadence of his voice is good. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, he really dives deep into specific well, subjects. He's a good and, storyteller. That's yeah. one thing I was telling people who never listened to Dan Carlin or think about listening to Dan Carlin. Uh, he. he he makes history very interesting. He's not like a history professor where he makes it boring or it's just the facts. Like he tells he tells a story. Yeah. Like he he paints a picture for you while you're listening to what he's saying, and he also gets the different uh, viewpoints too. Of like he gets different historians viewpoints. Like well this this historian this prominent historian said this, but there's been debate of whether he was right or not. And he explains yeah. that that viewpoint too. So you gain like different sides of the perspective, also. I think that's real important, you know. Getting getting both sides, that's yeah. The, that you got to get that. But uh, yeah, he's a. It's a. Yeah, his podcasts are long, but they're worth it. Yeah. I I listened to the whole uh, Wrath of the Cons. Oh you, yeah, you know you, I missed the, that one. That was a five part one. You got you have to buy it now, but okay. I think they're like a two dollars each off of iTunes. Um, that was a freaking great series yeah. where you talk about um, Genghis Khan and a. Uh, this empire, yeah, yeah. There were some, there were some crazy shit they did. That'd be and a they guy took over like have to dinner too, wouldn't it? Yeah, <laughs> he basically took over the known world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. I remember um, some story that wasn't, it wasn't the Romans. It was, yeah. I think Genghis Khan came after the Romans. Yeah, it was um, Budapest or Ukrainian. It was. Close to Eastern Europeans, mm-hmm. uh, Genghis Khan sent an envoy. Yeah, is that, is that the right word? Envoy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he sent an envoy to. Uh, I forgot what what culture it was. Basically, it was to, I think it was like actually peace peace mission. Yeah, yeah. And um, the 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 well, we're just going to use Ukrainians. The Ukrainians. Sure. I'm probably am wrong about this, but yeah. the Ukrainians uh, end up killing the envoy. So, <laughs> so Jagus Khan said his all well, his generals, the general hunted them down, and they didn't kill him at first. Yeah, they oh, man. they uh, I think I think they killed a lot of um, the soldiers. They, they 
they ba- they made a giant pit, put the soldiers' bodies in there, bodies in there. Then the generals that were still alive, um, they put them in the pit too. Put oh, a geez. floor above the pit and were eating dinner on top of the. <laughs> I'm like, what That's the? That's insane. What the yeah, fuck yeah, is yeah, that? Yeah. They it's sent the brutal. message. It's like, well, this is what you got. <laughs> that was a horrible yeah, message. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they just ate, uh, ate on top of them. Like, what the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what would constitute a perfect day for you? Oh man. Pretty close to had it today, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the weather was really beautiful yeah, this it's, morning. It's close to Thanksgiving, and it's only uh-huh. seventy degrees here in Florida. I know it's <laughs> great. And uh, but uh, yeah, I think a perfect day would be waking up, uh, coming coming outside to find that it's like, you know, earlyish autumn. So so seventy degrees or so. Uh, the woods are thinning out. You can see real far. And, uh, yeah, you know, I don't know, man, having a quiet breakfast with my wife, <laughs> enjoying some time together. Man, I'm a simple dude. I don't like, <laughs> I don't know, like just being able to chill and relax for a bit <laughs> and, and, and look at some things. I mean, I, uh, one of my favorite vacations, I mean, this is not really answering your question, but nice. one of my, one of my favorite vacations we ever took, it was a, it was a wedding anniversary. And so we, we rented a houseboat mm. and we spent a week on the St. John's river on this houseboat. What? Oh man. If you get if you, I mean, it was stupid expensive, but it was so <laughs> worth it. Cause like the whole week I did not have to wear shoes. I did not mm. even have to wear a shirt most of the time. Like first thing in the morning. Had some beautiful breakfast and some coffee, and around about ten o'clock, got a rum drink with some fruit in it and an umbrella, good. and just like rode that <laughs> slight buzz all day. Fished when I wanted to, swam when we wanted to, and just like you know, just cruised around in this like nice and slow boat. It didn't go fast; it was easy to steer, you know, and just like enjoyed the nature. And that that would be, yeah, that would probably be my perfect day my i couldn't have much more than a week of it though because <laughs> after a while i get restless yeah well, you know yeah that's, that's good that, to have those weeks or days but like you need a you need to balance it out with work too yeah absolutely but yeah that i like when it's time for me to enjoy me time i love to just kind of relax and contemplate maybe i got a book uh, you know, maybe I've, maybe I've got a podcast to listen to, mm-hmm. or, you know, maybe I just like to, uh, we, my wife and I'll just sit here in silence sometimes for, you know, <laughs> that's part of what I love about her is like, we don't, we don't always have to fill the air with noise when we're with each other. You know, we can just, just enjoy the, just the time together. Yeah. Yeah. We do a lot of canoeing too. So Ooh. that's a good time. Like we'll, we'll canoe. The Santa Fe river is pretty close by and, uh, you know, we'll bring some food and we'll cook out and uh, canoe for a little bit. And, and yeah, there'll be, there'll be times where we just try to be as quiet as possible. And I'll, you know, every, every paddle gently put it in the water and kind of like a game <laughs> out of it. Like how quiet can it, can it be? You know, we'll get real quiet and just, just float down the river. So <laughs> I think those are some of my best. Yeah. Those are some of the best moments. Well, it's- very peaceful out here. One thing I noticed while we were talking, um, how quiet it is, especially for all the listeners. I just remind you, we're re- recording this outside, and super beautiful out here, super peaceful. Thank you. So, man, this yeah. is really nice. Let's sit here and talk. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to hear cars or anything. Um. Do you have a secret hunch on the way you'll die? Ooh, yeah, that one's a that one always catches uh people off guard. That's a cool question. I like it. A secret hunch on the way I will die. <sighs> I could go two ways with that. Like, I mean, I guess my hope is that I will die. Uh, you know, 
quietly after a, after a, a, you know, without a long illness or anything like mm-hmm. that. Um, but I, I do think I have a sneaking suspicion that I will probably die foolishly <laughs> uh, doing something dumb that I think I could do. And I probably could have do when I was like 20 or mm-hmm. when I was like now, like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 38 right now. Uh, but I'll be like 60 or 70 at the time. <laughs> and I'll go, no, 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 I could do this. And then I fucking try and do it. And I can't, you know, shift in an anvil that's too heavy for me <laughs> or, uh, you know, that's, that's probably what's going to do it is, is something, something silly like that, you know? Cause I, I find myself doing that even now and I have to stop myself. Um, not that I'm old by any means, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll find I'm pushing myself in the workshop or in, in, in other parts of life as well, you know? And, and I like, I get too carried away and maybe I've been drinking a little bit and I'll, I'll start doing something crazy <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's, it's, it'll probably end up being something like that. I think that'll, uh, I don't know. That'll do me in. <laughs> and will falls on your foot. No. Uh-huh, yeah. no. <laughs> oh man, that would be terrible. That would be terrible. Oh, but I do, you know, I think about, so like, uh, my wife is, is 15 years older than I am. Mm-hmm. And so it is something I, I occasionally think about is like, you know, I don't know, death and dying. And like, what, what am I going to do? Like, I'm assuming that, uh, my, you know, my wife will be the first to go because she's older than I am, but at the same time, women tend to live longer. So maybe that won't happen. Um, and also because I'm a dummy and (laughs) that might do something (laughs) stupid and terrible. Uh, you know, and, and, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know, but I, I, I try not to hold on to life so dearly, you know, the, that like dude if i'm on a machine pull the plug like like it's not worth it if i was trapped if i was trapped in a cave Mm -hmm. and the only way to survive was to eat the dead body members of the people in it like nah fuck it i'll just die it's fine (laughs) like like life isn't life is precious and i love it love it but i'm not so scared of death that i would i would I would do things to prolong my life that are not what I would think of as moral, you know, or that I would think of as okay to do. You know what I mean? Like, like if I'm faced with, you know, like you're like you're in the snow drifts and you got to survive by eating somebody or you're trapped on an Island and like, like, okay, what's better living the rest of my life with the memory of like eating my best friend's liver. Oh. No, fuck it. I'd rather, I'm going to die. That's fine. I'll just die. It's okay. Oh. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's a, it's, it's to me, it's not the end of the journey. It's, it's, it, there's another leg of the journey after death. And in some ways I'm excited to see what that is, you know, like how neat will that be? Um, so I, you know, yeah. So I don't take a, I don't take a, I try not to be fearful, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, and, and because of that, I'll probably end up doing something <laughs> dumb. <laughs> Falling off a cliff. Finding find you know? a bear. It's like, well, good thing I yeah, made these axes. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. I'll probably, hey, man, sure. I'll probably get to use my bear hatchet. <laughs> and it, I mean, it, that may very well be the case, you know? It may turn out that, like, you know, if my wife passes away first and I'm old man and I'm lonely mm-hmm. and my body ain't working so well, I may just decide, no, fuck it. I'm going to take my best axe. And I'm going to go out into the fucking, into Yellowstone and I'm going to go up against a bear and like, you know, nobody will ever find me again. That'll just be the end of that. My, I always want to touch on that. Um, I, I got my hunting license last year, Florida. Excellent. I have a rifle. I'm balling 30, 30. But I um, always thought like I should bring a spear with me. That's kind of like a last resort kind of thing. Sure. Just sure. like, hey, this our ancestors used it and, yeah. and, and proved it works. <laughs> like it freaking works. Oh, yeah. Well, and people do. Uh, it's 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 a pretty it's a pretty common pastime to uh, go boar hunting uh, and go p- wild hunting with the wild pigs. Mm-hmm. And so it's they're an invasive species here in Florida or pretty much anywhere. And it tastes good. Yeah, it tastes super good. <laughs> it tastes good. <laughs> and uh, and and you can go you can go spear hunting uh, for for wild pig. Uh, actually, a, a, another blacksmith friend of mine is going to do that. Oh wow! Uh, in a, in a couple days down south. So, um, yeah, that's, that's legit, dude. You should do that. 
<laughs> Maybe I get you commissioning me a spear. Yeah, I mean, that nice to have. We'll go together. Yeah. Um. So next question. Oh yeah, it's not one of the questions, but I want want to ask you this anyway because you you mentioned it. How do you got? How do you guys meet? Because you said that she's fifteen years older. Yeah. So um, I mean, we we knew who each other were because uh, we both worked at the same natural foods market, mm-hmm. and she was my boss. Um for a little while there and so like i knew who she was but we didn't really like like fall in love or really you know connect uh <laughs> until a mutual friend of ours started a Dungeons and dragons game <laughs> and uh <laughs> I've, I've been i've been playing ever since i was 16 years old my mm-hmm. dad got me into it and i was i mean come on it's it, i basically my life now is a Dungeons and dragon yeah. game i'm making swords and axes and things <laughs> so it's like you know it's it was it was i've always played it and uh, he had started up a game, and I didn't know as many people in town. I didn't know anybody in town who played. And so when I heard about that, my ears pricked. And I'm like, yeah, cool. And I remember the first game, like, she sat next to me, and we were playing. And it just <sighs> – something must have clicked. I wasn't consciously aware of it for quite some time. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was like, here was a cool person. They loved playing d and And, like, you know, at the time – meeting another meeting a woman that played D that was like <laughs> also attractive and smart and interesting and had other qualities it was so hard to do yeah. you know and so uh it was like it was a bit of a dream come true and so we both share a lot of those kind of fun we like going to the medieval fair mm-hmm. together you know we enjoy like dressing up in the costumes and yeah, it's fun. uh yeah yeah you know we we played world of warcraft for a while together that was too much of a, a time sign it was a video game yeah <laughs> That's like one of those online video games, and that was a little too much. Um, but for, we played for a couple of years, and so it was just like – it was real important that we share interests, and that's what makes us a good couple and a good team. And Anyway, yeah, I met her because oh, we played D&D? Dungeons & Dragons. <laughs> <D&D>. <laughs> uh, I, was, um, I was in college. I was on the university's um, finance committee. Okay. So uh, we had clubs and groups and organizations come, come for us for their funding or – for special projects, and it was a D and D. Yeah, it was D and D. I was getting confused with magic. Yeah, but he explained the history of it, and he said, like, actually, D and D, even though people got a bad uh, or negative connotation of it, sure, it's like a, a lot of military this and a lot of sm- like. Yeah, he well, he specifically mentioned military. He said a lot of military generals play this game <laughs> because it actually teaches their strategy in chess yeah yeah like there's yeah. A, there's a lot more strategy to this game i can see that for and sure said, like it's a, it's actually a great game for like getting smarter game thinking about the bigger picture yeah 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 and you do i mean in a lot of ways you do have to think it's a it's a free form sort of storytelling kind of event mm-hmm. so you you're encouraged to think outside of the box so to speak and so uh yeah i can see that yeah. that's cool yeah it was actually pretty interesting like man yeah. You can fully fund it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, if you could change anything about the way you were raised, what would it be? I'm I'm largely happy. I gotta say, I'm a I'm a lucky motherfucker. I mean, I'm largely happy with the way I was raised. Uh, good parents, you know, solid household, that kind of a thing. Um. My mom, and it's it, it's what I've come come to understand later why I'm so fascinated with edge weapons mm-hmm. because my my mom was really against firearms. Yeah. Even though my dad uh, had had been a marine and served in the Marines, uh, we were never allowed to have guns and firearms in the house. Mm-hmm. And uh, so and and even even to the extent that I was not allowed to play with like GI Joe toys or toys with guns. But I was allowed to play with He Man, who mm-hmm. had a sword, and you know the Ninja Turtles, and um, so that I, that actually is probably a lot of the reasons why I started doing the, what, what I did here. But uh, it is something that I I wish because my my father was a marksman, and um, he got I forget the he got some kind of sharpshooter's medal. One of the one of the few medals he got um, was for marksmanship, and he was a really good shot. Uh, so it was, it's, it's something that I wish I, I could have bonded with my dad a little more over, you know, having him teach me how to use a gun and how to shoot and, and do all of that kind of stuff. Um, 
so so that would I think that would be one thing uh, that I would I would change and then uh, you know uh, my my parents eventually got divorced but that was mm. I was in my 20s I'd already moved out of the oh, house okay. uh, so it wasn't so much as how I got raised but it, it was a real uh, it, it you know it's still and it still ended up kind of breaking the family up and I don't really, oh. I don't really interact with my father very much anymore so um yeah so that's i don't know uh, i mean um divorce is bad no matter what uh yeah but i think it's better when you're older like you find out your parents did it than when you're like still in the still a kid because then like there's at i think it makes it worse for oh, the yeah. family especially oh, yeah. when it comes to child support and uh custody yeah, because my parents were divorced, and um, it's pretty bad. Yeah, that's a, yeah. That's How old were you? A kid. Eleven. Oh yeah. Well, the divorce the first time when I was a kid, so that was around around seven or eight. Okay. Then they uh, got back together and then divorced again. I think when I was thirteen, fourteen. Oh man, yeah, that's tumultuous. It, yeah, it's a. It, it kind of like affected the way I see relationships. Mm-hmm. And I. I think I got wiser about it just recently in the past maybe year, year and a half, where I realized, like, no, I need to find qual. I can't. What's the word for it? I can't project um, the qualities I want on a woman because she might not have them. Yeah. And I will get, and I'm yeah. will get disappointed, and that's also unfair to her, too. Yeah. So I kinda, I'm learning now. It's like, all right, if there's a red flag. Drop out. Yeah. It's, it's, Fuck. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, I did that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, <laughs> I literally walked away from her. Yeah. Good man. Like we, we were we were hugging and we were kissing, and it was a weird situation. Like she still wanted to go out. With... We met at my friend's salon, and she was a hairstylist. Like, she was freaking gorgeous, a beautiful redhead. And I asked her out. She's like. Why don't you come meet me for a drink after uh, you get your hair cut? Because she was getting off. So I met her and her friend, which turned out was her ex-boyfriend. And then she was talking about some weird shit. Yeah. And, like, she went to a sex club. I'm like, yeah, I went to, yeah, well, I went to a sex club, too, for the show and, <laughs> and for, for the website so I could write yeah, article yeah, yeah. about it. Yeah. But she uh, was talking about, she was talking about having sex with her sister. Oh, oh no, 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 not her sister. The the friend's ex bo- or the ex- boy, slash ex boyfriend yeah, sister. Gotcha, yeah, I'm like, yeah. what the? I'm like, yeah. He, I could tell he was getting uncomfortable with that. I made a joke yeah. about it. like, yo, well, I don't think he wants to hear about this shit. Yeah, right. <laughs> he, right. I like, no brother oh, wants man. to hear about that shit. Nope. <laughs> and then uh, he left. He was a cool guy. Um, sure. He left, and then she was telling me her story. And I started feeling. Um, she started opening up to me. Yeah. Uh, we kissed, and then. She said, well, I have a date tomorrow. Um, and I told her, like, well, I'm going to be honest with you. If you go out on a date with this guy and we're you open up to me and we're kissing all that stuff, I'm going to feel, I'm going to feel, um, I'm going to lose interest, basically. Yeah, like, yeah. I, honestly, sure. I'm, I may not talk to you again because yeah, 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 it's, it's just really weird that you're doing that. And then um, we talked some more and then we walked outside. And I told her, like, well, I thought she was going to go walk with me to my car because she lived down the street. I live in Mandarin. And, uh, she's like, she changed her mind when I told her where my car was at. It was like only two blocks away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I told her, when I asked her, like, well, would you want to go to the next bar, keep hanging out, keep talking? And she's like, no, I'm going to go. I just want you to go so I could go back in the bar and keep drinking. <laughs> and, like, and she kept kissing me. And then I had to stop and think about it. And she was looking at me like, oh, you look so cute when you're thinking about when you're thinking really hard. Like, what are you thinking <laughs> about? <laughs> and, like, I just. Yeah, I, I think I, I'm out of here. Well, I, I took out my business card for the show and I gave her to her. Like, what? You have my number. And I walked away from her. Yeah, yeah. And she yelled at me. He's like, that's it? I kept walking. He's like, you know, you ruined it. And I just yelled back. Yeah, I know. I kept walking. <laughs> 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 but it's like, I kind of learned now. That, that may, I may sound like a dick for doing that, but it's also like. You got to be discriminating. Man. Yeah, it's like it, no, I really want a relationship, and I and that's a, she has some major fucking red flags. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's man. like it, no, like it's not worth it. Even no. even like I want to have sex that night too, but like <laughs> now I'm thinking about it, it's like it may not have been worth it. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's it's a. Uh, 
I'm so glad I'm married. Like, I don't have to worry about that <laughs> shit anymore. That, is that's something what, that... That's what I, like, I know about the episodes. I've been knowing, like... Yeah. On both sexes, too. Like, the ones that are married, like, they actually are in a happy marriage. So, like, yeah, I'm glad I don't have to date anymore. <laughs> They're all, like, great. Like, I'm really happy I don't yeah. have to date. <laughs> I mean, I was, so te- I was so terrible at it anyway. Like, I... I this, this friend of mine and I, uh... You know, we'd go to some of the frat parties that were here. We'd just crash them. Mm-hmm. And you can go, you can go in. Like most people don't care, but we'd go to some of these parties and and try to meet girls. And at, there was a certain point where it just never happened. We just never managed to like mm-hmm. even have a fucking conversation with somebody. We were just terrible at it. Mm-hmm. And a- after a while, we decided we were just going to make a game out of it. And we were like, all right, let's create the weirdest pickup lines we can think of and just, just weird people out. And so we would lurk by the keg and and just, you know, and just like get free beer and then, uh, you know, like come up with these weird pickup lines until we got kicked out. And then it would be like, okay, how long could we do it for? And so the best one, it was like, it was like right on the edge of creepy. Um, I guess it was over the edge of creepy, but, uh, you know, the girl would come up and be like, Oh man, dude, I love your hair. I've got a mannequin at my house with the same style. <laughs> I got a mannequin. <laughs> and I would just like, I would just be enough to be like, okay, no, we weren't, we're leaving. And then the guys would show up and be like, you guys gotta get out of here. <laughs> you know? And I'm you, like, no. You know the drill. Come yeah, on. You yeah. leave. <laughs> get the hell out. Yeah, it just, you know. <laughs> I was like, fuck it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it, I mean, it, after a while, it all seems so false. Like, going to a bar and trying to meet someone and having a line or having a, uh, you know, like I always did better when I met somebody more organically, Yeah, you know, like you just, you just happen to work with somebody or, you know, you were friends of a friend and you went to the same party mm-hmm. and then like you got into a conversation Talking. just cause you were there, you know? And when it, when it happened more naturally, I had longer relationships and, you know, more interesting people. And most of my ex-girlfriends I'm still friends with because of that, uh, you know, cause there was something I liked about you. To start with, we just didn't click weather well. And so, you know, that was something like talking about my parents' divorce and was something I learned from their divorce. They never really had any interests in common. You know, they didn't even like the same, they didn't like the same movies. They didn't like, you know, the same activities. My dad would have loved to own a gun and, and, and take, take his son target practicing. You know, my mom didn't allow it. Um, there was, a, you know, there was a lot of things, you know, big, big things and small things. And so, um, as an adult, I think I was able to process it better and kind of go, oh, look, like, they didn't really were friends. Like, they didn't, yeah, you know? And, and people, dude, you got to be friends if you yeah, spend the life with somebody. Yeah, like, I remember talk, talking to this one woman, and she said, like, her husband had been married for 20, 30 years. And she's like, no, I, sometimes we just go camping by ourselves. We, we It's like what you said earlier. Uh, it could be quiet. We may not say anything to each other for a couple of hours, and it's fine. Like it, yeah. it feels comfortable. It feels really good. It's like you, you, it's like what you said. You don't have to fill the air. Yeah, it's nice. It's nice. All right. Um, we go to a fun question. If you wake up tomorrow and get any power or ability, what would it be and why? Oh man. Yeah, I've thought about this one a lot. <laughs> Definitely thought about this one a lot. Uh, it could be it could be any power. So. My favorite superpower is from a character called the Multiple Man. He was oh, yeah, X Factor for a while. Yeah. So he could create duplicates of himself mm-hmm. and they could go out and do things. And when they came back and he absorbed them, he would gain their knowledge and their experience. It was, it was as if he had done it himself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that would, I think that would be the best superpower. Uh, Cause then I could, I mean, I could be my own shop helper and things like that, which would be super <laughs> rad, right? I could get a lot more done, um, as far as like that goes. But also, oh, there's just so much in this world to do. There's so much to see and experience, and we don't, we don't get enough time to do it all, you know. And I'm always running across people who are more savvy internationally traveling, and they're like, "Oh, you must go to Paris, or you gotta go to check out this place." And mm-hmm. I don't know if I'll ever get to all of it. And it would be, I think it would be amazing to be able to just like smack myself in the head, create a little dubby, uh, mm-hmm. duplicate. Yeah, dude, go on. Like <laughs> I'd have, I've added five duplicates that worked, you know, jobs and they'd provide the money. And then, you know, you could, you could, you could experience everything and then, and, and then come, come back and have it all. And I think that's, that's probably a lot of my motivation in life 
for 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 things too is I always feel like I'm missing out. Maybe not always, but you know, I do a little bit. I feel like I'm missing out on things. Uh and not in a sad way and not in a way that like uh like makes me depressed or anything, but in in, in the way that makes me want to not waste time, you know, in a way that makes me want to like get out and go experience things. Like I don't I don't spend a lot of money on like stuff that sits in our house. Mm-hmm. Like if we if we spend a lot of money it's on a vacation. It's on a trip. Experience. It's on an experience. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so that's that's, yeah, that would be my superpower. <laughs> superpower. <laughs> More work to go around. <laughs> what conspiracy theories do you believe in? Ooh, not many. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I think that by and large, humans are stupid and terrible at keeping secrets. And I think a lot of the larger encompassing conspiracy theories would just involve too many human beings and someone would leak the, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like someone would fuck it up because we're fuck. you know what I mean? Like, I, I think, I don't think the government's that good <laughs> at like doing <laughs> <secrets>. anything, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like to, to be able to keep underground tunnel systems secret and you know going across the entire country or you know i mean so on on that scale or like the moon landings and whatnot like i don't think people are that good at keeping secrets and 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 i i just you know uh so i think it's possible that there's you know clearly like there's governments and companies that try to hide things from us Mm -hmm. and they they're doing things we don't know about um, but like, I'm, I'm by no means a conspiracy theorist. Uh, I, I like learning about him and enjoy, enjoy a lot of my podcasts are bent in that direction. <laughs> uh, you know, aliens and Bigfoot. And I totally believe in Bigfoot, by the way. Uh, we have skunk ape in Florida. Skunk ape. Um, <laughs> and it's like, it's like, I, you know, I, I believe in some of these things because it makes the world more interesting. And I like that. Mm-hmm. And it's fun to learn about them. And if it turns out they're not real, like I'm not going to. I'm not going to cry. And I'm not also like joining a Bigfoot hunting squad and going out and trying mm-hmm. to find them. Right. But, uh, uh, I, th- I think I kind of come from the direction that like, it's stupid when somebody thinks they know all the answers Yeah, to think that humans have discovered all the mysteries. There's, there's a billion things that we don't know. And this may be one of them. And, you know, if someone says they saw it, who am I to say you didn't, you mm-hmm. know? What, one thing I heard interesting, like, explama- explanation behind Bigfoot, like the famous video. Of, you know, oh, fuzzy yeah, image. yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody said that's a bear. It actually uh-huh. makes sense. He said, like, so bears walk on their hind legs. They can. And it might have been, like, the, he heard it from Paul. Yeah. But I'm more likely yeah. that they said it was a bear. And there was a bear. There was a bear in New Jersey who had deformed hands. Mm-hmm. And he was walking around. He would he would sneak into, er, like, more suburban areas. And he he lived his whole life walking on two legs. Uh, he, he'd occasionally get down on all fours to stop, you know. Mm-hmm. But when he was walking, he walked straight up, uh, and it was it was real weird to see. Um, but you know, it it at the same time, like you know, Jane Goodall, she's like the eight <laughs> she, person. Yeah, she's been quoted as saying something to the effect of like, she wasn't saying I believe in Bigfoot, Bigfoot, mm-hmm. but she said based on the terrain, based on the remote areas mm-hmm. and what's going on there there absolutely could be an ape that lives out there and we would never know it yeah and so it's not of course it's not coming right out and saying <laughs> it but it's saying there's a good chance that it might be apes. yeah like if it, if it is out there we may not see it mm-hmm. and you know because it's so remote so yeah you know well like how much people forget that america is still a pretty big country it is easily get lost yeah like, there's still parts of America we still haven't explored. Oh, man. And but, it's like, yeah, there's, you know, you don't even have to leave the country to go explore crazy stuff because mm-hmm. our country has got almost I'll everything, learn, yeah. you know? It's kind of, it's kind of, my dad had that take mm-hmm. when we were young and growing up and we would talk about trying to travel to another country for a vacation. He'd be like, no, our, our country, you know, he's a bit patriotic mm-hmm. guy too. And, um, you know, he's like, no, our country has a hundred things we haven't seen yet. Let's. Let's stay in our country and visit all of that. <laughs> I, there's something worth it. To yeah. that. I, there's something I like about that. Um, 
But yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's an actual conspiracy like on a big level like that. I think it's certainly not flat Earth. I hear about those, and I'm just like, come on, guys. yeah. I thought that was a, I thought yeah. that was a joke for a long time until I actually, actually started seeing it. like people actually do believe it, yeah. and it was a couple people on Facebook that actually believed it. And I deleted them. I'm like, I, <laughs> no, I, like, yeah, I, I, like, like there's there's something mentally wrong for you like if you actually believe this yeah yeah there, there is something wrong for you yeah <laughs> like i don't want to talk to you anymore when was the first time you fell in love and how did it happen oh man um i mean i'm a i'm a sucker for falling in love uh almost every girlfriend i had i loved mm-hmm. uh and i'm not like I'm not afraid to say I love you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I'm not afraid of love. And, and, and so I was always, and in some cases too quick, you know, to tell somebody that I loved them. Um, but sort of my first, my first serious girlfriend, uh, who I lost my virginity to. Oh. So probably the first time I, I knew what like real adult love could be, mm-hmm. uh, was, uh, was this girl named Jessie and she sat next to me in, uh, English class in high school and we were in orchestra together and she had the fucking, oh, dude, she had the best blue eyes. Like she had dark brown hair <laughs> and, you know, dark eyebrows, but her eyes were like, it was almost like she had like contact. She had these unnaturally beautiful eyes. And, uh, you know, we talk occasionally and I was, I was used to, I was such a big dork in high school and, uh, like I, I didn't have a lot of self-confidence, uh, and so I, I was just blown away when she started liking, like when she like acknowledged that she liked me and we were going to start dating, mm-hmm. you know, it was like, I was like, well, yeah, but you're pretty. Like what? <laughs> you're pretty. You know, <laughs> like that for real. <laughs> I was, I was amazed. And, uh, yeah. And so we, you know, we dated, I think we dated for almost two years in high school and, uh, yeah. So that was, that was the first time I, I, I guess I could say that I seriously fell in love like as an adult. <laughs> um, but I, oh man, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big emotional sucker. And so like, yeah, like literally every, every girlfriend that I dated for more than six months, I fell in love with and very few relationships that lasted, uh, less than six months, you know, like, like maybe two in my whole life did I like date someone and just go, okay, it's not going to work. Or usually I, I, I was the one that was dumped every once, like maybe, <laughs> maybe once I dumped, well, no, twice I dumped a serious girlfriend out of, yeah. Anyway, I, I haven't had that many relationships. I only had two serious ones. Mm-hmm. Um, both of them broke up, <laughs> broke up with yeah, me at the same, yeah. at the same place. Cause you're a nice guy at the same place. Yeah. Like the oh, first one geez. was, uh, both of them were short, short relations too. But the first one I went, we moved a little bit fast, and I I was really in love with her. Yeah. Um. We we, we agreed to get married, and uh, I bought a ring. Oh wow! Helped, All right. Um, we were doing long distance at the time, and she helped pick out the ring from the pictures that I went shopping for. Like I took pictures of the ring. Sure. Uh, she was a terrible person. She oh. was a really bad person, and she broke up with me at the spot. Then my next girlfriend <laughs> was, I happened to be the same spot. And she broke up with me because she was getting back her ex, her ex boyfriend. Oh man! Um, and what made it worse was, uh, <laughs> I was like, I looked around like, you gotta be fucking kidding me! <laughs> this is the where, same exact spot. Where was it? It was in uh, Port Canaveral, Florida. I was working for Disney Cruise Lines at the time. Okay. So it was in their the employee parking lot. For, yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for the people who actually lived in the United States or lived in Florida. Uh, okay. So I, since I lived in Jacksonville, I drove my car there. And they had like a place you could park while you're on the cruise, yeah, right? Yeah, while I was on the ship. And, um, but this time I was visiting her. And I drove my, I had a motorcycle all the time. So I went to go ride my motorcycle, go see her. I knew something was up. So you br- mentioned her ex boyfriend last time we talked. Yeah. And then she won't say, she stopped saying I love you to me. And then she's like, oh, about that. Me and talk about that. Then she started explaining it. And she was like one of these good Kristen girls. Oh, man. That, I may have uh, hope, hope changed her mind after that one. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, 
you, you were a virgin before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Front row. Uh, but, um, that was, I, actually, I can laugh about it now because it was actually pretty funny. She broke yeah. up with me at the same spot. I'm like, you That's Gabby so crazy. fucking <laughs> Yeah, she's like, so she's like, stop! Yeah. Like, why are you cursing? Like, like what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? Will you think I'm, I'm not going to curse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man. But uh, that was funny. It's like, yeah, I never talked to her again, but it's funny right? as hell. <laughs> um, have you ever had a spiritual or profound experience? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, what was uh, it? So, so. Uh, I'm a I'm a pagan, mm-hmm. and I I worship the you know various and sundry gods, mm-hmm. um, but primarily uh, Odin, Odin, you know the one-eyed Norse god, <laughs> the All Father. Odin, <laughs> uh, and then there's Hephaestus, who is uh, he is the the Greek god of uh, blacksmithing. He was he was a tinker and a, and a crafter of goods and. Mm-hmm. He made a lot of the weapons, so he made uh, like Zeus's lightning, lightning bolts yeah. and uh, a couple of shields for some of the the heroes. I think he made Achilles' shield. Mm-hmm. He also made these. He was he was deformed, uh, and he had these two robots that he made. Well, they didn't call them robots then, but they were metal men mm-hmm. that he breathed life into. So uh, robot, <laughs> right? robot, and they would they would help him out in his shop because he couldn't walk. Uh, and oddly enough, he married Aphrodite. It was his wife. It was like the most beautiful. He's the goddess of love. There's kind of some funny, some funny little things going on there. Mm-hmm. But um, so I've had two really profound experiences involving that kind of a stuff, or that kind of thing. And uh, um, so the first one was a dream I had when I was a kid. Uh, I was like 16 or 17. And, uh, I was, I was on the beach. I grew up on the, on a a barrier Island. So the beach was like right across the street. We could go, I can go to the ocean all the time. And so, uh, that was the, the beach in the ocean, the Gulf of Mexico, I guess really Mm -hmm. is a pretty strong spiritual locus for me. Like I've got good connections to it. You know, if, if I, if I, I dream about the ocean a lot anyway. So it was a it was a dream. I was on the ocean. I was on the I was on the the edge of the beach here, and the and the waves are coming in, and uh, it's a little bit it's a little bit of, uh, is it is it Oedipal, uh, but Freudian maybe. So mm-hmm. my my mom is swimming in the ocean. Yeah, and as she comes in, this enormous snake attacks her, and it like wraps all around her, and is you know mm-hmm. is is killing her. And so I'm like, oh, fuck. And I jump into the water and I got to save my mom. And I grab the snake around the head and it lets go of her and it wraps around me. And she gets onto the in, onto land and, and, and is safe. But here I am holding this snake and it's it's sort of looking me straight in the eye and I'm, I'm grabbing <laughs> it. And the waters are rushing and we're – I don't know if you've ever been in like really rough seas, like really yeah. rough beach. But, you know, those waves can be powerful and mm-hmm. they knock you and you spin around and you – so we're just like getting tossed all around and I'm, I've got this thing by the neck and it looks at me and it, and it, it like, you know, it's a snake. It doesn't have lips, but it says to me and I can hear it in my head. It says, I am Hephaestus mm-hmm. and, you know, woke up. Who's Hephaestus? So, oh, the, Hephe- okay, yes, Hephaestus. right. Okay. Hephaestus, the god of, the god for of, reason, uh, I, for some reason uh, I heard when you first said that, I thought Festivus, like. Like, yeah, yeah, like, oh, like, like yeah, like Festivus, yeah, 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 Festivus for the rest of us. Right. <laughs> it's a Festus for the rest of us. <laughs> so, <laughs> Ooh, Festivus. I like that. I might have to come up with some. No, because I like that, a t-shirt with that. For some reason, I, that's why I heard in my head the first time you said that. Yeah, Greek god. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So I, anyway, like at the time, I had no aspirations necessarily of being a blacksmith. I, you know, I I liked weapons and swords and things. Mm-hmm. I was still a nerd playing D anD D, but. Uh, I also didn't know who Hephaestus was when I first heard it. Like when I woke up from that dream and like, as I told my buddy or whatever, the next day, as I was talking about the dream, um, you know, like the name sounded Egyptian to me, Hephaestus, you know, like, oh, it sounds kind of Egyptian. So I looked up Egyptian gods and it yeah. was a snake too. Right. So like that really was like, Oh, it's Egyptian. Mm-hmm. And so I, you know, I looked, I looked it up and I could not, and the, the spelling's weird. And this was, there was not quite the internet yet, 
there certainly wasn't Google and Wikipedia um, and really good spell checkers. So there, it was hard for me to, like, I couldn't figure it out. And I didn't necessarily, like, spend six months straight dwelling on it. You know, mm. like, I tried to figure it out, couldn't. I went, oh, whatever, it's a dream. Um, you know, and then, of course, many years later, and I started to blacksmith, and I, the internet came around, and I was like, oh, you know, I came across different gods, and there was Hephaestus, and I went, oh, shit, <laughs> but, but why a snake? Yeah. And so, uh, you can see on my arm, I've got a tattoo here of what's called the Ouroboros. Mm-hmm. The snake is biting its own tail. Yeah. And it's also my wedding ring as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so this, this was a symbol that the, um, alchemists, so kind of before, uh, uh, science as a separate discipline mm-hmm. really started to branch off, but the sort of the beginning of the scientific process was being created. Um, I, Sir Isaac New- Newton was an alchemist, uh, and he's sort of the founder of modern science, right? And he was still this like borderland dude, mm-hmm. um, who still believed in some magic uh, a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. And so, anyway, the alchemists, as their symbol, would use a snake biting their own tail. They would have a ring made of it or whatever. It was sort of like the symbol of their trade to a degree. Uh, Their patron was Hephaestus because he was about, um, you know, he was about, like, metallurgy. And, you know, the alchemists wanted to transform lead into gold. Like, that's the classic concept. But it was more complex than that. But they were... You know, they were metallurgists and they were amongst other things. And so Hephaestus was their patron. And so that's where the connection of a snake and Hephaestus came from. And this was shit that I didn't know in my conscious mind until years after this dream. And of course, when you hear the, you know, I was telling you how Hephaestus had crippled legs. Well, mm-hmm. a snake doesn't have any legs either, right? Yeah. Uh, and so there was like a little bit of a connection there as well. And so that was something that like, it was weird because at the time the dream was profound and I was like, this meant something. But I kind of forgot about it and life went on and as it does, you know, and then all of a sudden I like, I forget what I was actually reading, but I was reading something and it mentioned the ring and the snake biting its own tail. And I just went, boom, oh, shit, I, knocked the microphone. Yeah. I just went boom in my head. And I was like, oh, fuck, that was real. You know, like he whispered, he told me his name, you know. And so that's that's that was pretty, pretty fucking cool anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the gods has graced me yeah yeah <laughs> i know i must do now <laughs> i kind of does so uh yeah so i you know that was that was a big one there you, know, you mentioned pagan gods and um also how um the norse trans uh, not transferred but converted to christianity people kind of forget like uh it wasn't a conversion per se it was more like how a corporate corporations um do a merger merge yeah. yeah it was actually a merger because there's a lot of pagan uh beliefs and rituals in christianity a lot oh, yeah. a good portion yeah. of it i mean the, all the fun parts of christmas yeah are pagan you know trees you know christmas gifts even the communion uh, uh uh i'll i haven't heard that one yet well think about it it's uh you sacrifice a body and you drink of the body yeah you drink of the blood you, uh, there's a lot of rituals of um uh, hopefully I'm not getting this wrong. Um, yeah, there's the there rituals back, pagan rituals of drinking blood. Sure, sure. Yeah. I the sac- believe it. You, you sa- you, there's always a uh, sacrifice in every religion. Yeah, you're still yeah. You're sacrificing a uh, the god's son. So there's there's a lot. There's a good portion of a Christianity that's it's, pagan. <laughs> it is. It is. And uh, and so that's you know that's something that like. Yeah, it's something I've had to do in my own life, you know. Like I'm, I'm, I'm a little hesitant, especially now that we've talked about my religious beliefs. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm probably not going to share this podcast with my my in laws, who are very strongly Christian, mm-hmm. but also like super good people. Yeah, and it would, I, you know, I don't know that it would break their hearts. I, I don't think it would be that strong. I think they'd still love me, but they would, they'd be really sad. They would not, they'd not be happy about it. It would cause them worry, and so I probably won't share this with them. Um, I mean, like, and so it's, 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 it's hard to, uh, to navigate that sometimes in the real world. And I would mostly, I would do it for the sake of my wife because I'm not, I'm not interested in like hiding mm-hmm. 
uh, what I believe and who I am. I, I wouldn't be talking to you yeah. if I was, you know. No, what the he- no, uh, your wife getting a headache from the parents. Basically. Yeah, yeah. It would it would just cause some strife that is not needed, and you got to pick your battles, you know. That's yeah, that's really, true. It's really what it's like. Is it really uh, necessary that you get an argument over this? <laughs> no, it's not. Like it's yeah, but uh... actually, I found myself lately because of um, this book I read called The War of Art, and he talks about muses. You know, the Greek gods of inspiration mm-hmm. and art. Goddesses, right? Yeah, yeah. Um He said, like, he, he talks about muses, but he kind of talks about it in a way... At first it was metaphorical, but more more thought about it. It's like, I think he's actually... is worshipping muses. Yeah, yeah. And I, saw, I found myself kind of like... <laughs> I'm writing articles, writing stories, and trying to find a good idea for the website and the podcast. I found myself kind of starting praying to them, too. That's cool, it's man. Like, well, I'm a, I'm maybe I'm agnostic, sure. And I, I like studying religions and myths. Yeah. And the more I'm studying them, I'm like, no, I think from everything might be the same thing, just different names and mm-hmm. different rituals. Mm-hmm. My mom might be worshiping the same god. So when I pray, I pray like, you know, whoever's listening, or whatever your name is, it may be Odin, Yawa, Buddha, uh, Allah, whatever your name is. Sure. I'm pretty sure you're. We're all talking to the same person. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Or Gaia. The Earth, Earth Mother, yeah. Earth Mother. Yeah. Uh, wherever you are, I'm going uh, to have an open ear to you. Sure, <laughs> uh, I'm sure. A, whatever name you want to go, go by. And that's, you know, I think that's probably true for a lot of it is, is, uh, cause you, and you see, like, you look at, there's a, mm-hmm. there's a guy, Joseph Campbell. He, yeah, yeah, I love Joseph really, Campbell. Really, you know, the, the, he was really interested in taking all these different myths from different cultures mm-hmm. and showing how, there's all these similarities. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, uh, uh, yeah, we're, we're all, you know, <laughs> we're all talking to the same <laughs> it's group like, of people here. Yeah, it's uh, like, a, like what happens if you get, you know, you die, you're like, yeah, what the fuck was all this wars about? Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, we never told you to go to war about this. <laughs> <laughs> we never told you to go kill each other because you mistake we have mistaken identity <laughs> yeah 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 and i you know i think it's i that's that's the part and i hear people say a lot too they get they're like oh religions like like my i've got a i've got a brother-in-law that's very strict atheist uh and uh you know he's like he's like religion is the cause of all the trouble and blah 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 and when like i'm like well dude i'm religious like i'm just not that kind of religious i mm-hmm. think you know i think that's a par- important distinction to have too um but yeah, there's there's too many of these larger religions that people use as as an excuse yeah. to do terrible things, and it's just I don't I don't blame the gods for that. Mm-hmm. I, that's just humans being stupid, you know, humans being selfish and humans being, uh, you know, humans being humans basically, and so you know I think I think a lot of this like the evils that people think religion of caused it's not really it's it's people people mm-hmm. cause bad shit to happen and that's just the cycle of life i think you know i don't think there's ever going to be a point in time where it's like um you know like star trek where everybody's equal <laughs> and they don't have money anymore and they just you know they, everybody does what they want yeah. and it's like it's like the, you know the reason to do it it's like i like what captain picard said um <laughs> i love star trek uh yeah. first contact <laughs> <laughs> like I'm not that type of Star Trek nerd, but I know every yeah, episode. Yeah, yeah. Like, like what he said um, in first contact. Like in the future, uh, they don't work for money; they work to better, better themselves. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's about the it's about the challenge, the journey in it itself. Right, right. I mean, that, and that's good to aspire to, but mm-hmm. I, I don't think we're I don't think humanity is ever going to get to I that spot. Well, there's a book I still haven't read it yet. It's been out for a few years. It's called Bear Angels of Our Souls. Mm-hmm. It's by this uh, psychologist, I believe, or yeah, I believe he's a psychologist. He got he got attacked for it, but the more I listen to it, I, I think it's just the critics being critics. Sure, but he was finding statistics saying like, no, things have actually did get better for humanity. Like there's less violence. So like, yeah, there's wars going on, but technically it's less. Like it's getting better. I you know I will believe that because like. And I've, I've used this argument before with talking to other people in that, um, you know, in the, say in the time of the pharaohs, right? Mm-hmm. We had slaves and that was fine. Yeah. And we could treat them like dirt and that was fine. And then, and then our God, our, our, our rulers, you know, Pharaoh was a God. 
right? And then as time goes on, it's like, okay, well, our rulers are not gods. They are men appointed by God yeah. though, right? Uh-huh. And then, you know, okay, it's not cool to have slavery. And and then and now now our leaders are what? Now our leaders are elected. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're not God's chosen. They're our chosen. And so I, I do agree with you. Like there's this slow drift towards more freedom, you know, more understanding, more, but it's, it's, it's hard sometimes to take that long view when, <laughs> you know, when there's like a genocide happening somewhere or there, yeah. you know what I mean? Or there's sort of something really serious and bad going on. And like, uh, you know, but like, like with the, what do, what do they call it? The, the, the sex trafficking that's, mm-hmm. that's going on right now. Um, you know, yes, it's still happening, but a hundred years ago, 200 years ago, it would have been happening and it would have been fine. Nobody would have thought it was a problem, you know, or mainstream social society would have been fine with it. And, and now it's like, okay, it's now we know it's bad. Now these, the people who still want to do that sort of thing, they have to be real circumstant and underground and it's not happening as much because of that. And, you know, as time goes on, hopefully that, that gets wiped out altogether. Yeah. One thing, um, because I did the episode on prostitution too, mm-hmm. and uh, read a really good book. It was about prostitution, but it had a chapter about it. It's called uh, "Renegade History of the United States." It's actually a really freaking good yeah, book. Yeah, yeah. About like the about the parts of history that you, they don't talk about in history class, mm-hmm. and they talk about prostitution and the sex, the sex, um, sex industry. So the guy was like, "Listen, this we want to have the West." If it wasn't for prostitution, he said, like, it wasn't, yeah, there were, they were sex slaves, but it wasn't the majority of them. Like, see, a good, actually, a good portion of the prostitution and the brothels were run by women, and these women were funding uh, schools, they were funding mm, City Hall, they were, yeah, yeah. they were funding actually public works. That's crazy. Yeah, it's like, cool. there's a lot, bro- and, um, they said they were, it actually, not only did they, did that, they actually, Brought in the sexual revolution, and um, they got women more comfortable with their bodies. Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. You, you, huh. you, it's okay to have sex. Like, yeah, yeah, right? like, yeah. You can have sex. Yeah. And uh, so he said, like, they actually brought in style too. They okay. said, I remember. He said red wasn't really a color worn back then, but they brought they brought gotcha. it into the into the fashion, and also lipstick too, and different types of makeup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, it's okay to look like this. Like, yeah, yeah. So it's, makeup we look at right now, it's like wasn't okay back then sure right well that's fascinating man yeah check that out um what's the next question what is your most treasured memory i mean i think probably my my uh, wedding day yeah. Well, little I remember of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's such a blur to a certain degree, but uh, we'll still have we'll still have friends and and acquaintances and people who who were there be like, you guys had the best wedding, and it's like it's it's almost fifteen years ago. Um, we've been married for thirteen. Yeah. Oh wow. Um, but yeah, we just like we just wanted to have fun. We just wanted it to be a, a party. And we had a, there's a local botanical gardens we went to. So it was outside in a bamboo garden. So it was, it was really, it was, a, it was a beautiful day. It was nice. Um, and instead of having a, 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 br- a bride or a, a, we call it bridesmaids and groomsmen and, mm-hmm. and a best man and a lady of honor. We had so many friends that were couples. So we ended up having four couples. And so this was also sort of a pagan mm-hmm. process here too was, uh, a, called a hand fasting. And so each of the couples had a different ribbon yeah. or a rope with a different color. And the, the guy who was marrying us was like, Oh, the, you know, the red is for purity and the blue is for this. I forget what they all are yeah. <laughs> to do. Right. But each couple walked up and, and my wife and I were holding hands. Each couple walked up and tied the, tied the rope around each of our hands together. And then the next person tied it. And so by the end of it, like our hands are tied together with these symbolic ropes. And so it was kind of a cool, uh, you know, I don't know. It was, it was neat. <laughs> and then we went, you know, we, the reception was in the same spot. We had a, um, indoor area for that. And 
Like my wife surprised me by having hired some uh, belly dancers to perform, <laughs> and uh, it was it was it was fun. And then at the end, um, this is this is the funniest part. Uh, so we had an after party after the reception. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a lot of friends that we couldn't afford to actually have at the you know it was expensive the feeding everybody yeah. and stuff at the wedding. So we had this after party at this other house, and so there's another pagan tradition. Uh, I couldn't tell you what culture it came from. And maybe someone made it up, but that's okay too. <laughs> uh, but the, the the tradition was like the bride's family would kidnap her from the wedding. Yeah. And the groom and his people would have to go and fight to win her back. Yeah. And so uh, my wife was down for this, but she was like, I'll, I'll be kidnapped and that's fine. But when we get to the party... I'm not a maiden in distress. Mm-hmm. When you fight for me, you have to earn me. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, I like that better. <laughs> like, that makes us both equals, you know? So uh, a friend of mine, like at the end of the reception, this guy that was friends with her, big dude, just grabbed her by the waist and put him over his shoulder mm-hmm. and walked off with her. <laughs> and, you know, she's like screamed. It was like, ah, you know, and it was like, everybody, like the straight, uh, I say straight, but sort of the normal mm-hmm. folks in our families are like, what the hell what is the, going on here? What the fuck's going on? Yeah. And I was like, it's cool. It's part of the plan. And so we cleaned up and went to the part, you know, went to the party and then I had to, I had to wrestle. And this guy is like, he's built like a bulldog and he was a, a wrestler in uh, high school. So mm-hmm. he's got some training and, uh, you know, I'm a scrappy dude. And I took a little wrestling. I played a lot of football. <laughs> uh, so I'm not afraid of being physical, but we didn't want to hurt each other either. But, he had gotten so drunk <laughs> that he started taking it a little too seriously. And I just remember like we're wrestling and he gets me my face in the dirt, like with his hand <laughs> on the back of my head and he puts his ear right up against mine. Oh, he's like, pin and, you. and he goes, he says, he goes, she's going to be mine. <laughs> like that. And I, I fucking flipped. Like I went my, my, Oh, like you, people say your vision goes like it did. And I, I like, I pushed up off the, ground and like i don't know how i got him off me but i didn't quite get him all the way off me but i pushed up and it was like all the strength i had i could not and i just like i crawled and like touched her knee and you know like that was it that was all i had i was panning i was out of breath i was and i tried to stay sober enough you know like i didn't like get wasted at the reception because i knew how to do this fight but i had some drinks you know Mm -hmm. i was tipsy and after like after i touched her and we hugged I immediately went and vomited for like <laughs> 10 minutes because it was just so physically like it was everything I had. And, and, and I, I threw up and I put some clean clothes on and I was fine. I had a great party afterwards, but uh, that was just like, it was, yeah, man, it was, it was, that's my favorite memory. I think <laughs> it's actually a good wedding. Right? <laughs> <laughs> now, the more I think about it, like, man, I kind of want to do my wedding <laughs> like that. That sounds a lot more fun than this uh, oh, normal yeah. You, yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, yes, I do. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> that sounds a lot more fun. Yeah, it was a good. It was a good time. <laughs> good time. All right. Biggest sacrifice you made in your life. <sighs> That's a toughie. The biggest sacrifice, huh? Mm-hmm. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, I think if you think about sacrifice as being the same thing as a regret. Yeah. Which I think a lot of people do because they, they're like, Oh, I gave this up. Mm -hmm. And then they, and then they, they're like, that was a sacrifice I had to make and they regret it. I don't know that I have any big ones like that. Not say I don't have regrets in my life, but I never consciously gave up a thing in order to get something else. And then regretted that decision. So, um, you know, so in a way that I give a sacri- I gave a sacrifice or I sacrificed, uh, but I'm happy I did. I'm glad I did. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I would definitely say like um, a certain amount of mobility in my life, being able to travel and being able to move around. I've sacrificed that for the joys of 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 having roots and being stayed put in one location and having a good community and growing it and so you know there are there are times i suppose that i i I ponder what my life would have been like if i was more of a world traveler um 
and 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 moved around more in that sort of sense lived in because i i grew up in one town i Mm -hmm. moved to gainesville boom i've been here ever since (laughs) you know i I, you know but it doesn't seem like a huge sacrifice because this is what i wanted um but it is one that i kind of acknowledge and so so in that sense there are some things that i've sacrificed uh but i don't i you know I don't think that's the terms most people think of that concept as, you know, I, I don't have children. And so a lot of people say, well, I sacrificed so many mm-hmm. things in my life to have children. And that's something that, uh, actually my wife and I can't have children. And mm-hmm. so, uh, it's not, I haven't had to, yeah, like, like I've sacrificed my individual freedom for, for being in a marriage. Yeah. Um, but I'm so happy I did, you know what I mean? Like, and so, you know, I, that's the only way I can think of these things. And, uh, so I don't, I don't know that I have like a, a... I, I think there's how many times have I asked that question? I, cause this was a re- recent question I put out on here Uh huh. and I asked this question to, um, I interviewed the C the CEO of, uh, the St. Augustine distillery. Oh, cool. Augustine, yeah. Asked him that question. And he gave a similar answer. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, he said like, he, because he has kids and he said like i don't want it's not regret and um i think sacrifice to me sacrifice to me is just uh you paid a high debt for something and it may yeah. not have been the same value not the same price you got back but it was a value way higher than the price okay that's i not, like that's, that that's the way i kind of like put it in my head yeah um but these are open-ended questions out. I kind of like telling that one because I want to get someone's different viewpoints on sure. it. Sure. And there are plenty of people who do feel yeah. like they've sacrificed and, and, and are regretful. Oh, I think I asked this guy, too. Um, he's a biker. but well, not a um, gang biker. He, he loves doing mall cross, and he owns his own garage. Okay. He, um, I think the biggest sacrifice he made, he said, like, marrying his first wife. He yeah. said, like, because he regretted it. He said, like, it was just... She stole from him, and it was just a bad divorce. Yeah, and, yeah. And he's like, yeah, that was something I wish I never did. All right, this is the last question. And this is a question that's very deep and personal. But I ask everyone, uh, everyone that does the episodes have to have to ask this. <laughs> it's a two-part question. Okay. What is the worst thing you... I'm sorry. What is the worst thing you have ever done? And what is the best thing you ever done in your life? Yeah. Well, you know, I already told you the best thing. I married my wife. <laughs> um, might get back to something else on that one. Uh, but the worst thing I've done, and this is this is probably my biggest regret. Uh, I'll try not to. I'm not going to put names in it. Mm-hmm. But um, I was I was uh, I was dating a girl and um, a woman. Yeah. Uh, in my twenties, and we were we were living together with some roommates, and I had been drinking a lot in that time period and uh this is actually this is actually a story that i told my wife i mean the the town of gainesville everybody knows each other like Mm -hmm. in certain circles anyway and so um this was one of the this was like the first time i told her something that was like serious and wasn't just like us hanging out and having a good time and um anyway right i'm stalling (laughs) (laughs) your your Uh, story tell it yeah yeah (laughs) so so i was dating this girl i was dating this woman and um, as, as is per usual for me, I fell in love with her mm-hmm. and she told me she loved me and, you know, I think she did in her way. Um, but she had, she had some issues and troubles in her own life that was, that made it difficult. I didn't realize anyway. Um, I've been drinking a lot, which was the trouble in my life. Mm-hmm. And, uh, she cheated on me mm. and, you know what I, I found out was t- there's no good way to find out, right? And she told she told <laughs> no, me though, no good way. <laughs> right? She told me, and it was devastating. I nobody had ever cheated on me before, and I'm I was such a dummy, innocent little guy that it just like it fucking hurt. And I'm not I'm not the type of person to bottle up my emotions, you know. Like I, I'm I'm not afraid of my emotions. I'm I'm all right, mm-hmm. you know. Like I hammer like I'm the most I do the one of the most manly things you can do by forging hot steel. <laughs> So if I cry, I'm I'm not fucking emasculated by it. Like you know what I mean? Like I've got the <laughs> especially now I do. But at, back then I wasn't as good at all that kind of shit. Um but I was, you know, 
basically what I had come up with was uh, that she had hurt me. And so I was going to get really drunk and scare the shit out of her and yell at her and fucking make her think I was going to do terrible things to her mm-hmm. and just scare the shit out of her. Yeah. And I, our, one of our roommates was one of my best friends. Um, and I told him, I said, look, dude, he was, he was like a little skinny wiry guy and I'm still kind of a big mm-hmm. guy myself. And I said, look, dude, like if this gets out of hand, I want you to take this frying pan and hit me over the head with it. Call the police, whatever you got to yeah. do. It's not my intention to hurt her, but I'm going to, I'm going to be fucking terrible. And so I bought a bottle of Maker's Mark whiskey Mm -hmm. and I ended up drinking the entire bottle in that one night. And I don't remember vast majority of, of the night. What I do remember, like I became such, I was such a horrible, terrible, the shit that came out of my mouth, the evil, the vileness, the fucking hatred and, you know, like, I, I just scared her to death. I fucking, she was in her room crying with the door closed, and I was beating on it and shouting about how I was going to do all these awful things mm-hmm. and how terrible of a person she was. And, you know, it, it, I, I, I don't know if she opened the door or if I broke the door in, but there was another memory of her being in the bathroom now and hiding in her own bathroom that was connected to her bedroom and me at that door and her trying to leave at one point and me like looming over her. And it was, I'm just, it I was, it was the, it's the most terrible fucking thing. I'm never, I'm I, spreading that kind of vileness onto another human being, you know, and, and I'm ashamed, I'm, you know, I'm ashamed of it. I, 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 I'm so glad I'm not that person anymore as well, you know, but that was just something that I'll always regret treating her that way. Nobody, nobody does, no matter what they do, nobody deserves. And I, the only little light, you know, kind of at the end of that is that my buddy did not have to hit me over the head with a frying pan or call the police. I, I didn't physically abuse her, mm-hmm. you know, but it almost doesn't matter because what I did was fucking vile enough, yeah. you know, that I just, that is, that's the worst thing. That's the worst thing I've ever, I, I treated her like she wasn't a human. And I think that that's the worst thing I've ever done. You know, it's, it is a terrible thing. It's no, no, uh, no excuses for that. It is a terrible thing. And it's also too, it's like, no, two wrongs don't make a right, but she did do something terrible first. God, man, it's hard to, I'm, yeah, I'm not, yeah. I'm not trying to justify it. I don't want yeah. to justify it. And you it. don't, don't feel like you got to justify it to me. No, I'm, I, no, I, no I'm, just, cause I'm trying to work yeah. it out on my head. Yeah. Um, at least you, at least you re- realize, uh, at least you realize it was wrong and nothing bad, no, nothing, Technically, it was kind of legal. Oh, I bet. Yeah, yeah. It was probably domestic, uh, some type of domestic uh, incident, but... Sure. I don't know. Yeah. Love love and heartbreak will make you do some horrible (laughs) shit. It really does. It really does. And adding alcohol doesn't help either. No, it doesn't. For... At at all. But it it was, it was, you know, at the time, it was like she deserved it, she earned it, and, you know... The more I look at it, that's – and understanding – my wife has helped me understand this a lot too and just the differences between like men and women as a big and, – and I know this too as myself. As a big guy, you're a big guy. Mm-hmm. We have to be a little more careful yeah. about how we act. We have to be a little more gentle with the world around us because we can fuck it up easier. We can scare people a lot easier and – Yeah, I felt – I felt like that with women. Yeah, there's, some, there's sometimes like I know. Well, a good a good example was when I was when I was a police officer. I I didn't know what made me. I didn't know I was doing this at the time. Yeah. Um. There was this woman who was. We met. We met while I was, she was a nurse, and she went. I used to have to go to her hospital a couple of times sure. to uh, drop off a suspect or take a report, and we met while she was drinking. While I was working downtown, and she was drinking, and she gave me her number, 
And she acted, she was interested first, and then she never called me back, and I didn't know why. But then she'll call me later. I'm like, what the? Yeah. So, um, I saw her in the ER, and I guess I was nervous, or I was still had my adrenaline going for something earlier. Mm-hmm. But I thought I sounded calm. Yeah. It's kind of one of those things. I thought I was, I know I was saying it kind of a little bit louder, because we're in the hospital, and I think I was just, she was a little bit farther away. Well, there was this police officer that was there too, and I saw her face as she looked kind of shocked. Yeah, and then realized what happened. And some police officer told me, like, "Yeah, it sounded like you were yelling at her," yeah. and like that wasn't my. I'm like, I, I didn't know why. Like, I, I wasn't trying to yell at her. I guess I was still jacked up from the incident, or like I was just really nervous, and I came out that way. Yeah, yeah. And, but it's like what you said. Like, if you're a bigger guy, um, it's it's kind of like a like you see a a dog coming at you and it's like a big dog and you don't know what the big dog is, is going to do but everybody knows that the dog is friendly yeah but yeah. you don't know the dog's friendly right right you There's, don't know that that's that's yeah yeah and if a little dog came at you you wouldn't care if it was friendly or not mm-hmm. a little dog like who cares right you're not gonna mess me up or yeah do anything and so that's something that uh like you you i don't know there's a there's a dichotomy there where you just can't, you can't treat, as a person I am, I can't be as full-on, angry, mad, terrifying mm. as someone else. Because, like, because I'm, because, it because I am who I am. I don't know how else to say that. You know what I mean? It's like, like it's going, especially in today's world where, uh. Let's say you don't do anything violent. You just start yelling. Right. Because you're a bigger guy. The perception is like, oh, he's going he's going to do something dangerous. He's going to, oh, he's acting really dangerous. But even though you might be having the same emotion as someone else, like the same right. anger. Right. If you're a bigger man, then it's yeah. going to. It's going, if, it's going to be perceived a lot differently. Yeah, like if 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 I was in a you know in an argument with a woman and she got mad enough to hit me, mm-hmm. that's a way different situation than if I was in an argument with a woman. I got mad enough to hit her. Yeah, you know what I mean. And, yeah, it, and some of that is it's not so much necessarily a woman, but I think we our culture is going to make that a, a a larger dichotomy. But I've also like. I know how to punch mm-hmm. and not just flail at somebody. Yeah. And so that's part of it too. Like if, if, if you were untrained at physical violence mm-hmm. and you tried to hit me as hard as you could, 50, 50 chance, maybe I shrug it off. Yeah. You know, like, it doesn't matter. But if, if I get mad enough to hit you as hard as I can, like it's going to matter. It's going to matter. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's, so I learned a little bit of that. Like that, I think that was an important lesson treating that girl that way i think it was something i had to do or not had to do but like i made sure i learned from it i guess is what i'm trying like to say see, I, I think every and i still learn from it i think every man and I, I, i'm pretty sure every woman has because I, I think men has a physical aspect and the an anger aspect yeah uh to scare the opposite sex and for women's um aspect they have that uh, emotional manipulation or uh they know they know how to get into someone else's head. <laughs> like, well, I'm not I'm not saying yeah. that like be sexist, but like it's it's, yeah. it's true. Like uh, a man a man could scare a woman by just uh, the size and being completely angry and in, in the physicality, which is which is true because men are most men are bigger than than women, right? And then women have their their adaptations. Like they know how manip um. Man, manipulation sounds pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. I understand what you're saying, though. But in, in the they, other they, sense, they, they understand emotions a lot better. Right. They right. They, under, they they understand emotions and how to use emotions a lot better. Yeah. And they I think that's very true. And um, unless um, unless uh, guys like train psychologically or knows about emotions and and mindsets, women are probably more adapted to that, and they they'll use that as their adapt that that yeah, adaptation. Right. right. I, I kind of a funny, a funny uh, story about that, and something that like I've talked with, you know, my wife and other mm-hmm. female friends about too is just uh, <laughs> so I, I, as a bartender, I was uh, this just happened a few weeks ago. Um, I'm at the bar, I'm 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 giving this guy a beer, and we're talking about different kind of beers, mm-hmm. and I was like, oh, this is a really good beer. Uh, you know, you can just you can just take it and suck it down. It's like a real light beer, easy to drink. And he was a, he was a, he was gay. He was wearing mm-hmm. a gay pride shirt, and he was like. 
Yeah, that's not the only thing I like to suck down. <laughs> a big veiny cock. And he said that to me, you know? And, <laughs> what a gay guy. And, and it was just like, it was like, the only way that situation works is if a gay guy says that to another guy, mm. that situation works. If I were to say that to another lady who is a bartender, <laughs> that would be f- way wrong and way out of line. And, and what it comes down to is... When if I say that to another lady, there's a real good chance that that lady's going to feel fear when she hears it. Yeah. And if a gay guy says that to me, there's like no well, chance that's that that's I'm going to feel fear. Right. Right. Yeah, and and so there's it, like it's and a lot of people like to go. Well, it's not fair. Boys and girls are you know you want to be treated equal, but you also want to be treated different. Like yeah, that's how it is, man. Well, people kind of the whole equality thing. Like one, I think there will never be equality as for factual reasons like right we're different so, yeah everyone's you like if you want equality then everyone needs to be the same it's not gonna be like that yeah um do you do you treat people fairly yeah you do treat people fairly but um i i say like a really good example i'm pretty sure it's gonna come somebody's gonna take this the wrong way <laughs> sure. i'm like there'll never yeah. be there'll never be equality with the sexes and a good reason is if a woman hits a man it's not a big fucking deal. The the man's supposed to shrug it off. Right. Now, if the opposite is true, a man hits a woman, it's it's gonna be a big fucking deal. The yeah. guy's gonna go to jail. Yeah. Even if even a woman say the most vile and horrible shit, like you could think of the most horrible shit to this guy, and the guy's just the whole time like, hey, please stop, please stop. Right. And he loses it. There's one punch. He's a monster. Yeah. But if a woman does the same thing. She, she's just a bitch or right. something like that yeah yeah and that's yeah. why that's one of one of the reasons why it's not gonna be we're not gonna have equality with the sexes i mean and like i know somebody's gonna take this the wrong way that's not saying like women can't be ceos or women can't i'm like no like i had plenty of women that were bosses i never thought ain't right anything bad about yeah, 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 below yeah, them. Yeah, yeah it's not saying about about that or you can't pr- you can't do job you, you, there's women that can do the same job as men, yeah. blah, blah blah. But to say there's going to be equality of the sexes, which is is simply not true. Yeah. Especially when it comes to biological, emotional, like men and women experience emotions differently. Um, except strangely enough, women have a higher pain tolerance than men because of childbirth. Okay, yeah, yeah. And one thing I, I did see it when I was a police officer when we did uh the taser training. Uh huh. Everyone, every guy fucking screamed, and me, especially me. I probably, I did a backflip. No <laughs> like way. I, like I, I oh, got man. tased in the ass, though. But, <laughs> but all the women that got tased for the training, yeah, did not scream. Did not, wow. They, they took it. They just sat wow. there, like, <laughs> they, yeah, they, yeah. They, 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 you could, you could look at the face. You could tell it hurt them. Sure, but they never screamed. All the guys screamed. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But um. Yeah. Yeah, like, I know, I don't, it's, it's a sticky wicket, man. It, it's, it's, a, like, it's a difficult it, thing to navigate. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a difficult navigation, and it's like, and, it's, and you do want to treat, you, you do want to treat men like, women like, like another one of the guys, but also it's like, you can't do that, in all honesty, yeah. like, because if yeah. you treat, if I treat, a woman like I treat my friends like when we t- make the nasty jokes or say, you know, penis jokes and shit like that, especially at work and sexual harassment. Right, right. And it's yeah. like it, that's another yeah. reason why it's not there's not gonna be equality with the sexes. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, yeah, we, uh, we could go even further into that one, like workplace and, and yeah, workplace and, 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 and sexual harassment stuff and, um, you know, the, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Well, let's end this on a good note. Okay. Um, this is a great interview. I really, I really Thanks, learned man. a lot. And cool. uh, really interesting. You're a freaking great guy. Aw. Um, nice. Website, any type of information so people can buy your uh, products? And- sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, you can find me, uh, crookedpathforge.org mm-hmm. is my website, crookedpathforge.org. You can find me on Facebook. And inter- Instagram also as Crooked Path Forge. Um, what else? I you know I I make stuff for sale. I do custom work. I also teach blacksmithing classes. Mm. So if you're interested in that, 
um, I can get you started. I would also recommend looking up uh, the Florida Artist Blacksmith Association. Faba. Faba, yeah. <laughs> Faba. <laughs> and they're at blacksmithing.org. Uh, and they're a really great club. The meetings are free. So it's a really good place to get to know people and find some tools and, and, and get started on a cool adventure. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you guys again for listening. Come check out the website, ataboolife.com, where you can read some interesting articles, short stories, some books on there, all the content. Uh, all of it's free, so check out at ataboolife.com. And also, too, if you want to check out pictures of today's episode, check go to the show's Instagram page, same name, ataboolife. Thank you guys for listening, and uh, have a great Thanksgiving. <laughs>